the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First thing we're going to do is have the swearing of Shirley Doheny as our new town clerk. Shirley Doheny. I, Shirley Doheny. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear faith and true allegiance to the United I, States of America. That I will bear faith and true allegiance to the United States of America. The state of New Hampshire. The state of New Hampshire. And will support the constitution thereof, so help me God. And will support the constitutions thereof, so help me God. I, Shirley Doheny. I, Shirley Doheny. Do solemnly and sincerely swear and affirm. Do solemnly and sincerely swear and affirm. That I will faithfully and partially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge and perform. Discharge and perform. All the duties incumbent upon me as town clerk. All duties incumbent on me as town clerk. To the best of my abilities. To the best of my abilities. Agreeable to the rules and rec rules and regulations. Agreeable to the rules and regulations. And the Constitution and laws of the state of New Hampshire and the constitutional laws in the state of New Hampshire. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Shirley, you got to be official and sign. All right. <laughs> Next time you can do all this stuff. <laughs> Again, congratulations. Thank you very much. Next thing we'll have is public comment. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak? Please give your name and phone number. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh -oh. Ah, look at that. Sorry. So I am I'm Dean Merrill. Um, I'm here for two reasons. I'm at 20 High Street in Hampton. But uh, I'd like to basically uh, kick off the parade. And uh, the uh, theme this year is. Uh, I believe uh, simple, but I think people can do a lot with it. Uh, the neat thing that the committee has decided is that the Grand Marshal is going to be the uh, um, the beach lifeguards. Oh, nice! We thought it was uh, just a Good. neat thing with the awards they won. So, I've talked to Patrick, uh, the head, and he's all excited, and, and, the, and I'm going to get the gang out here. So it should be a fun time. So, but I appreciate the selectmen and the voters, you know, supporting the parade, and uh, so I wanted to just drop off and. and I don't want to kick off Christmas season. Uh, it's still fall, but this thing is, is only 60 days away. So. so that's one comment. The other comment is just a general comment and personal comment. Um, I seem to be hanging out over at the uh, cemetery more often, but uh, I did want to make a comment. And I know it's not this board, but it's the trustees up there. But you know, I will say that it's, it's nice to see the work that's been done in the last six or seven months. Now, the trees have come down. I know they've always done a good a good job up there, but um, just to see that fence come down, it just just fits into the neighborhood now. Good. So it's a, you know I really appreciate that if you can pass that on the trustees, but I also know that you guys have been working on it too. So good stuff. So enjoy the Thank evening. You. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Anybody else from the audience that would like to speak? Hello. Hello. My name is Megan Granger, and I live at 39 Moulton Road in Hampton. Um, and when my husband and I bought our house on Moulton Road in 2005, we were newly married, and we knew we wanted kids. Um, the residential street with sidewalks seemed ideal. Um, there were lots of kids in the neighborhood, and it was a quick bike ride to the beaches and walking distance to downtown, each public school, the library, parks, and playgrounds. Um, since then, though, um, in 2004, directly in front of our house, I witnessed our then three-year-old Wes being hit by a car. And a week ago today, our two-year-old dog, Ruby, was killed by a truck. 
in that span of time as well on our street another child and at least one adult have been hit and another pet killed i've al also witnessed countless near accidents um, recently a drag race between two winnicott students directly in front of our house while a group of about 20 to 25 kids were playing right before school um, drivers regularly pass one another despite the double yellow lines and generally speaking, people are con consistently racing up and down our street, um, exceeding 45 to 50 miles per hour. Each time they fl fly by, um, all I, th and I'm shaking even thinking about it, but mm -hmm. all I think about is if they had been driving by when Wes was crossing towards me on that day four years ago, he wouldn't have stood a chance. Um, and my next thought is that it's just a matter of time until that type of tragedy becomes a reality. And so over the years, we've gone to desperate measures to slow people down, some which are too extreme and embarrassing to share, um, but others that include <laughs> rolling balls at tires, screaming, jumping in the middle of the road to stop speeding cars from continuing to endanger our kids. Um, we've also my neighbor, my neighbors and I have also chased people to gas stations, to the church, oh. all over town to ask them to and beg them to please slow down. Um, so um, we've rep repeatedly called the Hampton Police Department to share our experiences and request greater police presence and speed deter deterrence such as crosswalks signage, speed bumps, speed monitors, cones, anything. Mm -hmm. We've basically been ignored. In the last year, I can think of only two attempts to make Molten Road safer. A speed monitor was mounted for a few months and then removed. And then a few weeks ago, after I, the day after I called, um, after the drag race incident, a police car was plopped midway down Molten Road, fully visible from both ends of the road with a mannequin rather than a real officer inside of it. At this point, not only because I've been impacted personally, but because it's a larger community issue, I hope something can truly be done to make our streets safer for the many children who live and play on and around Moulton and for the, all of those kids, and it's a constant stream of kids who use our sidewalks to get to and from every public school in Hampton. Mm. Um, and also for other drivers and all pedestrians. Um, residents of Molten Road look forward to the opportunity to elaborate on our concerns and propose specific improvements. Um, I also did um, email each member of this board with a petition which includes resident signatures and additional, additional comments um, from a lot of people in town which I hope can be reviewed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Anybody else from the public would like to speak? Um, hello, Seth McNally, 22, uh, 226 Exeter Road. Vivi Barlini, 82 Hampton Meadows. Uh, we're both involved with the Friends of the Hampton Rail Trail or uh, the New Hampshire Seacoast Greenway. We've been up here before in front of you. Um, tonight we're on the agenda for a maintenance agreement. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that's a draft. We didn't really envision it coming for a full vote or anything like that. It's more a, a working document that we wanted to sit down with the town administrator as well as, as review and try to get to something that'll help move this project forward. Um, this project was part of the Safe Routes to School. It was one of the identified projects as being beneficial to the town. It was also part of the 2003 Hampton Master Plan as a project that would be of great benefit to the town of Hampton. Um, eventually, it'll connect Boston and Portland, Maine. Uh, right now, we're just trying to connect Hampton and Portsmouth. Um, there's funding already at the state level, five and a half million or, or so. Uh, and it mostly comes from congestion air quality mitigation funding, which would have no uh, impact to the taxpayers of Hampton. Um, the state is looking for some local support in the routine maintenance, um, litter pickups, um, debris removal, um, but not full on infrastructure improvements. Um, as it goes, when you use congestion air quality mitigation funding, and I might have messed up that acronym, um, they're required to put in the trail. They're required to update the infrastructure that's already in place. And you'll see some of that messaging throughout the maintenance agreement that you'll see. 
Um, there was a, a first rendition you guys have, have seen as well. Um, I think there's a lot of improvements in this one. And if we do anything at this meeting today, you know, it would go a long way uh, in having your support in the project as a whole. I, I understand you might not support the maintenance agreement as it stands now, but um, your endorsement uh, going to the governor would be a great uh, help to us. Um, the state has just re-entered negotiations in the last two weeks. They've made an, another offer, uh, much more significant than the offer they made two years ago. Um, and we can give you a lot more detail on the things that have been going on, but it's just a great uh, project for everyone involved, uh, local citizens, uh, the, the, the younger children have a safe place to travel, um, place for uh, people to get off Route 1 um, and, and create another commercial avenue, a lot of economic development opportunity, uh, health uh, can increase people's <coughs> health, uh, lifestyle and activity, um, and the average trail user tends to open their wallet when they're on the trail. Um, I can tell you this from my own family, if you get down to Newburyport, if you go to Goffstown, you go to Salem, all these places where rail trails already exist, uh, Stowe, Vermont is an absolute beautiful trail uh, that hundreds of people are flocking to and, and spending money, and I think uh, the same could be said to happen in Hampton. So um, if you guys could, you know, at least endorse the project, I know the maintenance agreement might need some work still, um, but let's remember that it's a draft and we're more than welcome to, to hear the feedback and try to get to a place um, where we can move this project forward. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anybody else from the audience would like to speak? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for announcements and community calendar. Mary Louise. Um, nothing at the moment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to say that I, as well as you, attended the USS Virginia plaquing ceremony last Wednesday, and that it was really an honor for Hampton to be uh, considered by those guys to be the host community. It was. It was. It really was. So, thank you. Jim. Yeah, I just, just a couple of things. I know we don't respond to public comments, but I just want to say that one, one problem with the Molten Road thing is the stupid GPSs send people down there. I know. It's a it, which, is, which is a problem with a lot of yeah, neighborhoods right. nowadays, yeah. Yeah. that when yeah. you go in some place, your GPS all of a sudden is oh. sending you through residential neighborhoods. Right. Oh. And it's, uh, you know, it's a problem. And I agree with them that, that residential neighborhoods, you know, just we need to do something to slow people down. But besides that, mm -hmm. announcements. Uh, on October 22nd at the Community Evan, the Rotary Club is having a fundraiser for uh, end polio. Now, polio is not a big deal in the United States right now, but it is in other countries, and it's a, it's a virus that can be carried by plane or anything, so somebody mm -hmm. has it, so they've to wipe it out. And I would just like to say, I think tonight, the Community Oven is doing a fundraiser for the Winnicunit High School soccer boosters, and uh -huh. that most of the restaurants and businesses in town are big supporters of everything that goes on in this town. Okay. So I think we should really shop in restaurant locally. Huh. Rick. Um, I just wanted to say it's nice to see that uh, summer seems to be continuing, although it seems to be coming to a quick halt. There's been plenty of people at the beach. And um, I just want to say one thing. I s definitely sympathize with them on Moulton Road, but you have to make sure the children don't play in the street. It's so important. And the same thing with dogs. Yeah, thank you. I want to say something on the roads. I am sorry that Moulton, that's happening, but I got to tell you right now, it's all throughout town. It's in my neighborhood, and kids aren't playing in the road. They're getting off the bus and walking to their houses. They're riding their bicycles like they've always done. And I'm sorry, but it, there's too many people in this town. You know, we just keep building, building, bend, yes. building. I mean, yes. go through the neighborhoods. And that NHMA conference I went to, Hampton is not the only one that is facing this. Well, I live we on have, the biggest drag strip in Hampton, right where I'm at. Well, we have and the same that, roads. Those aren't people that are the moving same to roads. And we just have, like, instead of a house having two or three cars in the driveway, they have five or six now. And, you know, it's because of the accessory dwelling units. I'm sorry. And we're not the only town. And Moulton Road is just three times as worse because it connects all the schools. So I really think that we need to start mm -hmm. because, I mean, kids should be able to get on their bikes, go down to the beach, yeah. go surfing down the wall without the, like they always do without worrying about getting killed by a car going 50 miles an hour. So I sympathize and I hope there's something we can do for you. Thank you. I, uh, 
First of all, I want to congratulate the chief on getting his FEMA grant. We had uh, <laughs> Senator Hassan here today, and uh, she brought that down, and I think that's uh, a great benefit to your department. Second of all, I want to congratulate you on you getting your master's degree in emergency service management you, through Columbia Thank Southern you. University. And you just completed that, so nice. I think that's very good. So next we have a consent agenda. We have a parade and public gathering license for Veterans Day. Did we do minutes? Oh, no, we didn't do I'm minutes. I'm sorry. I also moved the twenty fourth of September minutes. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. I will so move October 1, non-public and public session minutes. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. See, we bailed you out. Thank you. You did a great job. Thank you. So again, back to consent agenda, we have a parade and public gathering license, and we also have a welfare and rele welfare lien release from 37 Barbara. So move the consent agenda, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion and a second. I'll second it. Rick will second. All those in favor? Unanimous. <clears throat> Next, we have appointments. Steve Falzone from the Trustees of the Trust Funds for a quarterly report. Good evening, Steve. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. All good. We've been watching things go up and down. Oh, there. man. It's been quite the ride. Uh, Q3 ended pretty good for the town. Uh, the return was a little bit less than it has been, but the fund is really a value type fund set up to pay dividends all you know the, the stock portion of the portfolio uh, returned a little bit less than we have uh, we're on track to probably return around a little over seven hundred thousand to the town this year uh, other than that it's pretty much status quo i mean things just keep moving along as they are i mean last thursday friday were pretty ugly days in the market uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and then it bounced back a little on Friday. Today had a quiet down day, but yeah. I mean, we met this afternoon, and well, portfolio still looks pretty good. I mean, it's yeah. on track to do what it's supposed to do: return money to the town and yeah. be around, as Bill Hartley used to say, for a hundred years plus. Good. Excellent. Any questions for Steve? Well, well no, just prudent management, which yeah. is what you guys have been doing that's all along, much it, Mary Louise. and so that's it's good. Exactly, we're exactly where we're at. Uh, Dave Mays and his team at Bearing Point does a really good job for the town. I'm really happy and lucky to have him. Yeah. Regina? I'm good. Thank you so much Thanks. for the job you guys Jim? do. Thank you. You guys are doing a great job. Yeah. And Rick? Hang in there. Yeah. Very Thanks, good. Guys. Yeah, appreciate it. Oh, Thank you. Budget. Oh, we have He's your budget here. while you're here. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, you're here. Call me on your that. budget so you won't have to come in. Yes. Uh, it's been $1,000 for the last five or six years, I think. Yeah. So. Might as well leave it right where it is. I mean, the only money that ever comes out of that is what we pay Joan to uh, take the minutes. And we've been quiet, no trips to Concord lately, so that's uh, any been quick. Qu any question on Steve's budget? No. I review. No problem. I'm ready to make a motion on that one. Okay. What is. Make a motion. <laughs> I'll make a motion that we accept the budget. I'll second that. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank, Thank you very much. Sure. Send me a trip for next week. Appreciate it. <laughs> All righty. That's hard work tonight, Steve. Yeah. Thank you. So but we actually have the, the, the fire chief next, but before he does, we have uh, Christina here, uh, Christy Christine. here from the uh, uh, finance office. She's going to give us a little overview of the budget and the budget process. So, Yeah, every year we I've been trying working with Fred and Jamie and the department has to improve a little bit on our budget presentation. So this year I have a, just a real quick PowerPoint <coughs> just to show the overall impact of the budget and then I'll quickly break down the police and the fire budget since you're, you're going to be reviewing those tonight. So as you can see the budget that's in front of you tonight is for $28,175,614. That's an increase of $1,333. $333,302 over the 2018 default. It turns out to be 4.97%. Here I kind of just broke down to show what makes up the budget. So I'm not going to read all of these to you, but it was in that memo that I had provided to you guys also. Um, but it shows that wages are $12.2 million of the budget, or 43.58%. And it breaks down insurance, utilities, debt, retirement, contracts, other benefits, and gas and diesel. So it kind of gives you an idea of what makes up that $28 million budget there. And then it just shows you the graph with the dollars and the percentages. 
And then here, if you look at the 4.97% increase, it's showing that wages make up 448,380 or 1.67% of that increase is from wages. Contracts account for 352,516 or 1.31%. Other items outside of the utilities and debt and all that is $172,494. Utilities account for $99,853. Debt accounts for $90,914. Insurance, which would be your workers' comp, your property liability, and, and your health insurance fall into that category, $71,296. Retirement, that's all NHRS, uh, accounts $33,338. Gasoline and diesel account for 31945 in benefits such as um, Social Security, Medicare, things like that is $32,566. And just gives you a little pie graph yep. there to make it fun. That was good. And this is just showing, um, I was asked by Fred to show appropriations approved by voters in March. So it's basically showing you here that 520,910 or 39% of the 1.3 million is things that were passed and voted on by the voters when they went to the polls um, in uh, March specifically, such as union contracts, uh, the contract for the trash trucks, the trash truck lease and items like that. So we just thought that was an interesting fact for you. And then last, the impact on the tax rate um, for a 1.3 million increase, you're looking at 0.37 cents uh, or $150.92 for the average family home, which is 400, is valued currently at $407,900. And then here I just basically broke down the police department for you. His, the budget that will be before you tonight is $4,370,000. $4,370,918. It's a $97,555 increase or 2.28% higher than his default from last year. The wages make up $3,693,312 or 84.5% of the police budget. Mm -hmm. Gas and diesel make up $67,148 or 1.54%. Utilities make up $118,140 or 2.7%. And other items make up $492,318, 11.26%. Then we just have some pretty graphs for you on that. And then I've also broke down the 2.28% is broken down. You can see 1.56% of it is related to wages. And the next highest is 0.7 um, for his other items. And then we have the fire department. Their budget tonight is $3,865,000 or $302. It's an increase of $210,847 or 5.77% from over last year. Wages make up $3,346,614 or 86.58% of the fire budget. Gas and diesel make up $18,014 or 0.47%. Utilities make up $96,282, 2.49%, and other items make up 404393 or 10.46 percent. Good. And there's his graphs there. And his uh, wages there are 4.72 percent of his budget. So that's just kind of a quick little rundown for you guys for tonight. And I'll plan to do the same thing um, for the police and fire. I mean, for the public works department when, and maybe recreation when they're here. Thank okay. You. Yep. Thank you. Alrighty, so Chief Ayotte and Deputy Kennedy. Thank you, Mayor. Christy said we were going to have to fight for the table, but <laughs> apparently we didn't have to. I said you would lose. <laughs> I would lose. First of all, thank you very much for the kind words, Jim Bridal. I appreciate that. And um, I'd like to start with uh, our departmental update, if I may. Sure. So on our quarterly report, I would like to say good evening to you and to all the members of the board. Deputy Kennedy and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. We know you have a large agenda this evening, and we'll keep it brief. In the way I talk, it should be very brief. 
In total, we have fielded 3,563 calls for service from January 1st through October 13th. There were 1,734 fire calls and 1,829 patient contacts. This is equal to the number of calls for service last year for the same time frame. On the fire side of the house, on Thursday, October 11th, 2018, Hampton Fire Rescue responded to a fire at Foss Manufacturing. The alarm of fire came in while Ambulance 3 and Engine 1 were on a medical aid call. A subsequent phone call was for a fire in an oven. Ladder 1 was first due and signed off with smoke showing. Ladder 1 does not have a pump or carry water. The fire was in an oven used to produce a plastic-based fabric, and it's 30 yards long. Mm. It took two hand lines to extinguish the fire. This fire went to a first alarm assignment, which brought in several mutual aid companies to assist, and we certainly are grateful for their support. <coughs> engine 1 cleared the EMS call and responded, as did Engine 4, and you heard that correctly. Engine 4 returned to service. It came back from Wisconsin, was inspected once more, and then returned to the fire department on October 4th. The repairs included electrical pin replacement, aluminum diamond plate replacement, <laughs> replacement of a flex hose on the exhaust, and as you may recall, this engine was damaged as a result of flooding at the beach during a blizzard in January. Hampton Fire Rescue did respond to Lawrence during the time of need. Uh, on Thursday, September 13th, Engine 1, Ladder 1, and C1 responded as part of a very large mutual aid response for multiple structure fires, explosions, and gas emergencies. In total, we were there for about 14 hours. And on Friday the 14th, they requested an ambulance and the crew was dispatched and worked calls in the city. Mm -hmm. On the emer emergency medical services <coughs> side, we had 1,829 patient contacts from New Year's Day to October 13th. There's less than a 1% difference from 2017 to 2018 numbers. This is important because if you recall, I told you in May that we were behind last year's numbers. Well, we caught up significantly. Mm -hmm. In fact, July surpassed previous years. Hampton EMS personnel responded to 43 calls for overdose and administered Narcan 37 times. They've worked 17 cardiac arrests and treated 40 patients for acute coronary syndrome. They've also treated 24 patients for stroke. I'm very proud to inform you that firefighter Kate Meehan and firefighter Dean Sonis have completed their paramedic school at the New England Emergency Medical Services Institute and been certified by the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians as paramedics. Both have passed their New Hampshire State Protocol exams and are working as paramedics in the field. We have purchased the Zoll Auto Pulse devices we saw you about last month and we'll be deploying those in the very near future following some training on those devices. The Fire Prevention Bureau has performed 275 inspections and issued 159 permits and collected $5,860.50 from January 1st to September 30th. I provided a table which the folks at home can't see, but it, you can see that we are up as far as uh, inspections mm -hmm. goes. Year over year from 2016 and 17, we're higher. Same thing with permits issued. The fees collected are $5,860.50, about par with last year. The big number was 2016, which was 14482 but that was also some very large uh, projects that came in in the permitting for those processes, as we've discussed before. Seafood Fest saw routine inspections and code enforcement that vendors have come to know and expect. This year, all were compliant, and I am pleased to report that this was an uneventful year from a fire prevention standpoint. The Fire Prevention Bureau has seen a great many children participate in the annual Fire Prevention Week activities. This year, Fire Prevention Officer Bill Payne has developed a puppet show that engages the children and teaches them to be sure to have proper house numbers on their homes. Contrasting colors and a highly visible spot. This is a lesson for us all. The students keep coming. We expect to see 676 kids by week's end. They will all have a goodie bag prepared by Fire Prevention Secretary Stephanie Welsh to take home with them and share the message with their parents. The open house took place on Saturday. Despite inclement weather conditions, we saw a great number of people. Unfortunately, some of the planned events like Dart Helicopter and the Bouncy House were canceled due to weather. But the visitors were able to see firefighters use the hydraulic tools to dismantle the car. They also saw those tools break. And more on that in a minute. Communications. Hampton Fire Alarm has answered 18,182 calls for service from New Year's Day to the end of September. Labor Day weekend saw 203 calls into Fire Alarm which is double that of the previous year. On the administrative side, I think we've already spoken about this once, but I'm pleased to report <coughs> to you that the Hampton Fire Rescue was awarded Fiscal 17 Assistance to Firefighters Grant totaling $83,416. I appreciate your acceptance in September, and moreover, I appreciate all of you taking time out of your busy schedules to participate in the gathering this morning. Today, together with you, Mr. Welch, and U.S. Senator Maggie Hassan, FEMA presented the Town of Hampton with the award. 
The equipment this grant will purchase will replace obsolete technology and allow better communication within the department. I will be applying for an FY18 AFG grant to replace portable radios. The grant closes next Friday. This is an ambitious task. If this is successful, the replacement of these radios will remove radios that have um, passed their manufacturer's end of life date by four years. The staffing and, uh, for adequate fire and emergency response grant is expected to open in November. As we have discussed on many occasions, the town is growing. Mm -hmm. The Safer Grant Program would be an exceptional way to bring more staff to raise the level of service for the community. I hope to discuss this with you in the future. The Red NMX software project is underway. Data is being converted from the NMX, by the NMX staff from IMC to their platform. This would not have been possible without the support of Paul Parquet from the IT department and Lieutenant Tom Goditis of the Hampton Police Department, so we're grateful for their assistance. And thank you very much for your consideration. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mary Louise. <coughs> Not on this report, no, but this is, this is great. And your point is very well taken. I have already run that by the um, planning board on uh, all the new construction and the challenges. Want to that? Yeah, thank you, Chief. Thanks for the report. And also, thank you for all that work into getting that grant money. That was, yeah. Yes, ma'am. That worked out really well for the town, so thank you. The yes, ma'am. Jim? Yeah, good report. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Rick? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Excellent report. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So, in breaking with the agenda, would it be possible to talk about the waiver first, or do you want to do that after? Sure, we can do the waiver first. Okay. That's fine. So, I've been in front of you a couple of times to talk about different pieces of equipment that we're looking to purchase. And uh, one of the things that we absolutely need to purchase for Engine 4 is hydraulic equipment. And yeah. as I mentioned in the report, uh, the hydraulic tools are, I think that they were actually new when you were still a captain, Mr. Bridal. Okay? <laughs> so there's, they've been there a little while, and they've seen their better day. Um, we have done some research. We actually asked people to come in and form a committee, and Firefighter Squires and Firefighter Hickey together joined on the committee, and, as well as most of the other groups. They had, they had the opportunity to experience this process where we researched tools, and then um, invited in the top three brands and companies that were represented. They came in with their tools so that we could actually experience them. Through the generosity of National Wrecker from Portsmouth, they brought cars down that they allowed us to cut up, similar wow. to what we did on Saturday. So they were able to use the tools throughout the process. They found their favorite tools and the ones that worked the best. Um, in doing so, they also highlighted some that were not necessarily competitive from a standpoint of speed or uh, strength so they ruled that one out that particular brand out and it was really a, a contest between two brands uh, at the end of the day they chose to go with the Hearst tools the Hearst tools did end up costing twenty four thousand one hundred twenty five dollars the reason I'm coming before you is because I'm seeking a waiver from the purchasing policy because this cost over the last set of tools that were in line or the, the comparator um, there's a difference of one thousand six hundred and eighty dollars I'm sorry one thousand six hundred and eight dollars over the lifespan of a 10-year lifespan for these tools, it breaks down to about $160.80 a year that it would be a difference in, in cost. But the percentage is 6.89% difference in cost when it comes to that. These tools certainly are better for our needs. Um, they offered a safer approach to cutting the cars. It allowed the hands <coughs> of the operators to stay out of the way when they were actually doing the spreading and the cutting. And it also allowed, uh, these are going to be battery-operated tools like most of the equipment that you would buy today. Um, and it allowed access to the battery. So if you are mid-cut for something, whether you're taking off a door or something like that, and the battery dies, you can actually change it here. The other brand didn't allow that. This, this brand was far superior, and for such a little cost difference, I would recommend that these are the tools that we want to purchase for uh, immediate deployment, but we need a waiver. Any questions from the board? No, no, thank you. Good presentation. They, I, they have I'll make to the get motion that. that we grant the waiver. We grant the waiver. Second. Yeah. Motion made. Seconded. All those in favor? Unanimous. Well, yes. thank you very much. I so appreciate that. Do you need a motion you. now to purchase them? No. That's it. They grant the waiver. That's it. All right. Okay. So we move to budget. Everybody's favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a nice, clean budget. I. I I'm glad you said that. I think so. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is my fourth time in front of you, I believe, with budgets. And um, I've really refined the budget, I think, and with Mr. Welch's help, certainly. We've brought it down to where we, we feel it's the, the best operating budget that we can get. Um, in discussing it, we found areas, and with these the purchase of the tools, 
uh, Mr. Walsh has made a subtraction from my request because we're purchasing tools in this year's money. So that going forward uh, reduced our request to what you see in, in front of you right now. As Christy mentioned, this is a 4.72% increase all related to collective bargaining and wages. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a 5.77% budget on the table, but you'll see that that is uh, essentially a 1% increase from my request. So I'd like to do it however you want to do it, Mr. Chairman. Well, you want to go line by line or do you want to? Well, line by line. Well, section by section. Oh, section by section. section, by so. section. Now, I have a quick question on administration, the first account. Okay. Uh, it says this account funds the base salaries for the three members of the administrative staff. Uh, what was the percentage increase? Do you recall? For that particular part? Yeah. Uh, 4.38 in total, but that also doesn't, that also takes a, for that Thank you. About. Okay, 3.88. Yeah. And uh, and there's nothing, no problem for overtime or holiday. I don't know if anybody else has questions there. Anyone, anyone any other questions on? I just have one question on one. Are we just going? Go administration. So, but I'm just going around. Yeah. Here, yeah. Go ahead. Do you okay. have a question? Just on staff development, there's a 25 percent increase. There is. Uh, the staff develop development portion was to include, um, it's a very small number, 25%, yeah, yeah. but I think it's less than $150. Yeah. Um, there are numerous courses that have gone up in price, as well as uh, part of our memberships and things like that. So there's a cost increase that's been passed on there. Okay. I have a question, actually, but I guess it's for the whole budget. Is this, as far as staffing, what are we, is this staffed at what? Uh, current level which still brings us down to eight so moving forward with the idea of staying at nine all year would have certainly brought us in um, significantly higher okay. than where we stand um, as it stands right now the time that I sat in front of you in May and then or maybe it was early June and then we moved to have the potential to overspend the budget but to staff to nine we did that all summer mm -hmm. and as I've already told you too I also staffed to ten on several occasions due to the heat uh, we're still staffing at nine, and uh, based on what we're going to see from Christy Pulliam this mm -hmm. week with the numbers, I anticipate that that may change. But we're still remaining there right now and watching vigilantly. Okay, so this budget is for Does staffing not have, at nine. It, it's for staffing at nine with a reduction to eight. Okay. So All it right. does not include nine throughout the year. That All percentage, right. the last time we did that, brought us up yeah. somewhere over ten. Okay. For a budget. Thank you. Real quick, because we jumped to staff development, but tuition reimbursement remains uh, the same. Who, who, and what are you tuitioning for? I mean, what? So the the it's part of the town policy where yes. a member of the department can go take a class and request reimbursement if it's a class that's um, in line with the ideas of the fire department. Uh, I've taken part in that. I know that we've had two or three firefighters that have gone through that this year. So they okay. have taken a class and taken the tuition reimbursement. So it's being used? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, no question. So so just getting back to the staffing real quick on while we're talking on manpower. This is for normally nine, but can reduce to eight. Will reduce to eight. Will reduce right. to eight. So what we did, and, and I say that, but you know we've seen that we were able to maintain. What we've been able to maintain, I also have to impress upon you, takes into account that nobody in, nobody was injured. I had no members out as a long-term injury. Yeah. So right now, this has been covering their vacations, covering for sick leave, but not anybody who's out for a duration. So what we're looking at right now is the possibility of still staffing over the summer with the same, with nine, mm -hmm. but it, it remains where it is. I haven't changed the line items for overtime. Okay. okay. And you, you talked earlier about safer grants. I did. And I actually spoke with um, Chief Parr, who was accompanying us today yeah. from FEMA. He's our Region 1 rep. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned that that's going to be opening in November um, to, to apply for a safer grant. That would take the indulgence of not only the town manager, but the Board of Selectmen, too, to give a letter of endorsement saying that, yes, we want to move forward with this. It doesn't necessarily bind that decision and say that you have to move forward. But moving forward... Yeah needs yeah. your endorsement because too many communities have said yeah I, I would love to do that and then when the when it comes back they say what did you do that for 
there's a cost that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. Just like the AFG grant, we have a 5% cost match. With the SAFER grant, it's a three-year commitment when it comes to it. In the first year, the feds pay 75%, we would own 25% of salary and benefits. On the second year, it's 75%, 25%. In the third year, it goes to 35% and 65%. So the local community is not responsible for 65% of the costs. Mm -hmm. But for the first two years, essentially you're getting one fire, mm -hmm. you're getting four firefighters for the cost of one. Yeah. So that's where that play comes in. And the, and the whole reason, and my biggest concern for those is, is with going to 10, will allow you to put an ambulance at the beach Certainly. Yes. Well, all the time. Yes. And, I, you know, I've heard from more and more from time and time from people, that's what they want. Mm -hmm. I, I totally concur. I hear the, the same. Beach and, and I, that's what I was getting at. Was Absolutely. Right. You know, my, you know, so uh, I would say even if we don't get the safer grant, we may want to look at a warrant article for this year. So, and that's fine. Um, uh, we're, we're also working with the town manager to maintain the, a budget that is within reason. And the last thing I want to do is, is come in and be laughed out of the room by the town manager. So, you know, <laughs> is that right, Mr. Walsh? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, you know, if I come in requesting the moon, I expect not to get it. But as I told you when I was looking to staff to nine throughout the summer, you know, I've come in under budget now for four years, and that was strategic. I did that to prove to you that I was maintaining what I could. I'd come in and ask for money, but I maintained the level that I thought prudent so that moving forward, you would see that. And if we did ask for a bigger piece of the pie, well, you know what? I'm managing it correctly. Mm -hmm. So in moving forward, if we're looking to do that, that's fine as a community. I support the idea. I've already told you about the growth, and we've yep. talked about that ad nauseum now. Yep. Yep. But the fact is that as, as we continue to grow, we're going to continue to see more volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. I'm fine with the rest of the page on, on that one. Rentals, uniforms, supplies, and expenses. Anybody else have any questions on Yeah, I just have a question on, on fire su su suppression. Okay. Uh, it's over on two, you? right? Yes. Sorry? Page 46, or are you looking at the... I'm looking at the, the, the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet, okay. So oh. you're on two. All right. Is that all right? Yep. Uh, yeah, that's fine with me, sir. Okay. What line, Adam? What line? Yeah. Uh, 1,400. Okay. The OT wages. OT wages. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it was 87,000 last year was the actual. It was budgeted for 174 this year, and it's 195 <coughs> requested. Right. Because of the, um, the changes that come with the contractual obligations that are, okay. have already been spelled out. All right. Um, the officers received a contract this year that increased their salary as well. Yeah. Um, so that's what the addition was. Uh, again, like I said, the last year's budget, we, I, we did not have um, a vacancy after we filled in April. So there were no injuries, thankfully, and that were long term. And there was also uh, no vacancies created because we, didn't, we lacked staff. Okay, so, thank you. Yes, I sir. just think, you know, people, when they see an increase, oh, they like absolutely. to know exactly absolutely. why the yeah. increase has taken place. All right, we'll um, go down to fire prevention. Wait, what? Wait, Are we all done on fire suppression? Oh, Hold one, on. One sec. Jim jumped ahead a little bit. At the top of the uh, page, um, Which page? The gasoline and diesel. I'm a little nervous about that. I know that we don't pay tax <coughs> on the uh, fuel, but the way the rates are going up, Oh, good. I put all the gasoline and diesel numbers in based on our averages through the end of August. Prorated out, we watch them um, in regards to gallons purchased yeah. along with the price that we pay at the pump. So it's a thing that we've taken away from the departments over the last couple of years and brought it over towards the administration side, and we monitor it yeah. and adjust it along the way. So usually at the budget committee level, we have a firmer number of what we want to go with. And we have seen an increase, and Fred and I were talking about that, and yeah. the um, average cost, if you did like July through August, added another 10 cents onto it. So we will yeah. most likely be bringing it to the budget committee with um, a higher yeah. price per gallon. Okay. Because I, I got gas about a week and a half ago, and I noticed it's already up a couple of cents a gallon. Oh, yeah. Just, oh, yeah. yeah. <coughs> That, and that, oh, yeah. that gasoline and diesel all the way through the budget, I'm just a little worried. So why don't we go to the fire prevention? Sir, right. Any questions on fire prevention? Wait a minute, what? I'm going by, I'm what? not going by, I'm going by the, the budget itself. Oh, okay, I'm going page to page. Um, okay. We, we well, can sort up the page if we need to do that, but if we go by the budget, at least the line item will have 
Okay. What we need to do. So any questions on fire prevention? No. Nope. <coughs> Mr. Weddell is. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I knew you would, sir. <laughs> Part-time wages. Part-time wages increased by 15%. Yeah. That was a result of the collective bargaining agreement. Okay. Um, the fire prevention secretary's salary was increased as a result of the job performed and the fact that it hadn't seen anything for the duration of the, the job, as far as I know, in existence. So they, they um, did a salary adjustment, a wage adjustment that occurred, and now we're starting to see that as part of this contractual uh, obligation. Super. I got one question Go on this one. Um, under the training and recruitment, the last line, I see that you've gone up to the 49,000. That's in the training? That's training, not that's, that's fine. Not fire prevention. So. Oh, I'm sorry. So, no, that's I'm fine. Sorry. No, that's okay. fine. That's fine. I, I jumped just, ahead. I have a question just, on yeah. that section. Any, any on uh, more on I fire prevention? A, I have a well. I have a question on fire suppression because we kind of okay. Well, I guess zip I'd through that. Um, fireworks detail wages. Yes, ma'am. Precinct paying for that? No, ma'am. And that was a discussion that's, that was brought to the board, and yes. the board decided that this would be part of the budget. Um, and I don't remember, I don't recall when that was. I think that was two years ago. Yeah. Um, Chief Sawyer, who had discussed this with, with myself and yeah. the town manager, uh, for one year <coughs> we had been using the detail pay uh, out of that, I think it's a 24, yeah. is that right, Christy? 26. 26 one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and then we brought it back to the budget, the budget committee, I'm sorry, to the um, to our budget. The board from the Hampton Beach Voter Precinct came in and dis discussed that too. So that was a decision to leave it in our budget, and that's why it's budgeted as it is. I increased it by five hundred dollars <laughs> because I feel that we're going to have uh, yeah. an increase over that okay. due to but contractual. But since that is a precinct uh, uh, happening, uh, I think they should be paying for that. But we have to have it one way or the other. We do. It's required to have a firefighter <laughs> on scene. We've yes. had some real big injuries there uh, as a result of having explosives. Oh, so yes. Yes, <laughs> All right. So. Now that we're done fire suppression prevention, <coughs> we're on to training. Okay. I have one question, Mr. Chairman. Under training and recruitment, the last line. Mm -hmm. So we've gone up to the 49478 which is 39% <laughs> increase. But as of 831, we only spent 8600 Is that? That's not going to be a true number because uh, there's an <laughs> awful lot of, as you might imagine, um, carrying not only fireside but also uh, emergency medical services, we have a lot of requirements certifications and for that there's a lot of con ed. These con ed classes are costing us you know, a significant amount of money. There's, a, mm. there's actually a uh, conference at the end of this month that several of our members are attending and the cost will be coming out of there. There's a training item that's coming up uh, next week or the week after for the pump. Last week of October and the first week of November. So the last week of October and the first week of November we've hired in a training consultant yeah. that's going to be bringing a pump simulator so that our firefighters will have Ooh. pump training. Uh, it's been it's the first time in a very long time that we've actually done that, but that wasn't cheap. That was about almost seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Okay, so thank that, you for the clarification. Absolutely, that that number we also adjusted as uh, as we've discussed. We're trying to get a day where everybody goes and trains as a department, mm -hmm. as a group, so that the leadership and the the people are on that group can function as a team. It's very important that they get to do that. Yeah. Okay. And on training. Yeah, the same on the training. The same thing. I mean, I'm a hundred percent. For training, mm -hmm. certainly. Yeah, I mean that's a big right. jump, and as long as you can justify <coughs> that it's a necessary, you know, uh, component mm -hmm. of right. your training, I think that's really crucial that you get out there and, and justify when there is such yeah. a big jump. In, in so, so one of the other things that we uh, we have not done yet, in conjunction with the police department, we're working on a practical, um, like a clinical application for active shooter and hostile event. So ashy type. Um, uh, scenarios. We really don't like to talk about it, obviously, because it's not something that's comfortable, but this event is going to take a lot of people, a lot of time, and we're anticipating doing that in, in the new year. Mm. So, okay. so, we also so have to as far as in recruitments in that, and do you have any uh, recruitment tests coming up or? So we have, uh, we don't have any vacancies. Typically what we'll do is to create the list, we'll, we'll do that at, uh, around that time. We haven't had a recruitment list for two years now, I think, right? Right, we just only have uh, <laughs> Right. In February, or late Jan January, early February, we have a lieutenant's promotional exam. That list is going to expire. That was two years mm -hmm. old. Uh, as far as firefighters, we're, we're coming up, I think it's this summer, we're going to be due for a firefighter list. Okay. Okay. The, the additional thing, and to Mr. Waddell's point, there's a large jump in the medical services. That is our physicals. That's a 36% increase. Um, 
we have done a lot of research and we have found a vendor that gave us the same physical essentially at half price. Uh, we're very happy about that. But we also have to have the capability to do physicals because the New Hampshire Fire Academy now is requiring people to who are going to be doing a physical class. If you're going to a class where you're going to sit in a lecture, you're able to just take that class. But if you're going to be doing um, ropes or confined space or anything like that where you might have to expand yourself physically, you need to provide with them with a note saying that you are capable to do that. So we're planning for that so that if somebody wants to go, they can get a physical. If it, It's good for three years. So we anticipate that this will be cyclical and we'll see that happen. Uh, additionally, now with the cancer registry and the, uh, the state moving forward with their um, situation with the, the cancer law, we may be looking at expanding the role of, um, of examining people, blood tests, and that, that sort of thing. So that's why that jumped. Any alternate training? Okay, we'll go to communications. Wonderful. Wage line item is the wage line item, and it's increased uh, contractual obligations. The OT wages, we've increased um, contractual obligations, and I also put in for quarterly meetings. The fire alarm operators sit in a small box. They're up front. You've seen that box. I know that I've given you tours there. Um, and very often, they're, they're not able to pass on a lot of information when it comes to what they'd like to see and discuss things. So it's been proposed by Captain Cutting, who is in charge of that division, that area, um, to have a quarterly meeting so that they can come together. Um, I support that 100%, so I put that into the budget as well, and that accounts for that along with the contractual obligation changes. Any questions on The grant today, it doesn't have anything to do with any of this stuff? It doesn't? No, the grant that we received today will replace mobile radios, which are the ones that are inside of the fire engines and ladder. Um, it's going to be base radios, which is the one that's in the communications tower, and we're going to be putting one down at the beach, which it doesn't have right now. And it also will be buying pagers so that we can be alerted at home. So this scenario, this is personnel, whereas that's equipment and necessary to be changed out, but it's all different components. Any else in the communications? Repair services. The OT wages for repair services uh, allow us to drive the apparatus to get repaired. So that number has been raised, I believe it was two, or a year ago that we raised it to 1,500 from 1,000. Uh, when we're driving these apparatus, we're going to the places that can repair them, that, that are able to do so. Um, that's in Walpole, Mass, down by Gillette Stadium. That's also in Vassalboro, Maine. And it takes somebody six hours to go back and forth to Vassalboro. It takes somebody at least four hours to go down to Gillette yeah. and back. So this overtime comes for that. Also, <clears throat> the, um, the marine program, when we are moving the boats to go get serviced, both pre-summer um, season and post-summer season, that account line item pays for that. For vehicle maintenance, we have asked for a level budget. However, I have in replacement equipment also altered that because the deputy has talked about the purchase of, because of the, the situation with EPA, the DEF fluid, which is the, um, it's the fluid additive that goes for diesel emissions. And this comes at a cost. We have two ambulances now, one engine, I believe, right, that all need DEF. Yes. So we purchased this through our vendor. Uh, we get a, an exceptional cost, price uh, reduction on it because of that. but. We still need to purchase this. Any of the new vehicles that are diesel are coming out with that. So that portion of this budget is actually still in replacement equipment. Utility takes it now, too. And the utility, our new utility, which was uh, arrived a week and a half ago, yep. also takes definitely. Thank you. Any questions? When you send them down to Foxborough, do they get tickets to the game? They don't, but I've, no, no, I've heard a rumor that Deputy Kennedy has taken a photograph with a ladder truck in front of Gillette Stadium. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Haven't seen the photo yet. Maybe true. Stations and buildings. Stations and buildings. You know, we're exceptionally grateful not only to you but to the, to the townspeople to have given us two essentially new buildings, right? We have one brand new building at the beach. Yeah. We have one brand new facility uh, adjacent to the older structure. Um, but they're also brand new is five years old now. So a lot of the components have failed in various ways. Um, we have seen failures in boilers at the Winnicott Road Station and also at the beach station. When researching that, some of these components that are failing, they're, they're big ticket items, but they're failing as a result of electronic equipment. And electronic equipment across the board is coming back five-year minimum 
you'll see failure rates. And mm -hmm. that's coming from our plumbers, that's coming from our heating and ventilation <coughs> people. So the transition there, it's cost us a lot of money to maintain some of these um, structures and units already. We've had a couple of issues with an elect electrical surge potential, and we've had three circuit boards down at the beach that have fried. Um, we're actually looking at the handicap entrance power button because that's not working right now. But we feel that it may be as a result of the generator when it goes to switch to um, from street power to generator power and then back is surging a little bit. That's not going to be a cheap fix if it's a transfer switch, which is kind of where the theory is right now. So as these buildings start to age, we're seeing some maintenance that really needs to happen. And that's why the increase here. Any questions on that? Uh I don't, but can we go back? Uh, sure. Yeah, yes. I have a couple things. On, on the, under communications, you have replacement of equipment, mm -hmm. and you have the mm -hmm. marine engine. <clears throat> so that's not in communications. That's in replacement equipment under fire suppression. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's 42, 202, 7450. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, and I was going to bring that up, actually. Um, Mr. Welch and I have a gentleman's agreement on Friday that we're able to move forward with that. Yes, sir. Sign the purchase order. Yeah, there we go. So Marine 2 will have a replacement motor. Uh, I've already talked to Lieutenant Weiser, who's in charge of the Marine program, and he's going to be contacting the vendor, and we should be seeing that this week. Hopefully, he's going to move forward anyway. So in doing so, that engine costs $7,132, and that includes labor. It doesn't include the cost of getting it there. That's on us. We're going to have that transported down, and I believe it will probably be Lieutenant Weiser that transports it down. It's going to Gloucester, down to Bronze Yacht mm -hmm. Sales. And that's where we bought it in 1997. Mm. This motor is 21 years old, needed to be replaced. Yeah. So, and, and that that's well used, right? I mean, just so people sure. know that that's <laughs> not something that just sits. No, it, it has a different job too. Um, at Marine One obviously is the larger vessel, and that's the one that goes out into the open water, into the deep water. Um, it's not capable necessarily, especially uh, we all know the dredging situation. It's not designed to go into the harbor or up the river. Uh, this boat is a shallow pontoon boat. It's a it's a um, zodiac, so it's a rigid hull fiberglass with air foils, air pontoons on the side, um, and it's designed with a shallow draft so that it can go into the river, and it can go into the shallower areas where the sand is. It also operates around the jetty and in, on the inner rocks. So anytime we have uh, people there, it's able to go perform. Okay. That boat's almost 20 years old. It's 21. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was talking to Mr. Walters, I said, hey, this thing's 19 years old. Yeah. And then I went and I looked at the registration, I go, hey, this thing's 21 years old. Yeah, it, was, yeah. I mean, it was getting up there. So. Was. Yeah, I have a follow-up on this. Where You are risking the lives of firefighters going out, doing the rescues on the water because uh, the state beach is attracting a lot of people and a lot of them are a little careless in the water. Uh, is the state offering any compensation for Financial? the uh, for your boats and your engines and so forth? I think I know the answer, but I, I'd like to bring it out public. No, but I would like to say that the the state operates the the lifeguards, and they're on duty from the end of May yeah. through beginning of September. Um, we work exceptionally well with them in concert with yes, them. You do. They do daily rescues that they never talk to us about. We never hear about them. Right. When it exceeds their capabilities, we get the call. If it's after hours, we get the call. Yeah. If it's off season, we yeah. get the call. Yeah. We also have been helping out other communities. Recently, and if you saw the news in Seabrook, there was a tragedy where two people perished as a result of being mm -hmm. taken out in a rip current. Mm -hmm. um, on that particular day, yep. that was a very mm -hmm. difficult situation. The water out there was, it was a very angry ocean, and um, the lifeguards were called, yep. and they actually responded to that. And it was, it put them in great danger because they were responding on a jet ski, two people. Uh, you've seen the lifeguards, they're in a pair of shorts and a torpedo um, mm -hmm. flotation yep. device. They actually, it was oh. one of the lifeguards that floated the, the second victim in on the torpedo, but they put themselves in harm's way, and we work together, yep. but we're not compensated by the state, to answer your question. Well, I, I figured that was the case, but I thought I'd ask, because we are running uh, these boats and this equipment at a state park, at a state beach, rescuing the uh, people who come for the summer, and I think the state could kick in a little money for your department. I'm not sticking up for the state, but we also work with fishermen 
Absolutely. We also Party worked boats. with the Coast Guard. No doubt. Yep. We also worked with, with mariners that might be offshore, that and not necessarily from the state beach. So there's a lot that we're doing. In other communities. We've even right. responded, before I was here, but we responded to uh, to um, and right, right Harbor yeah. and the um, the Isle of Shoals. Merrimack. Yeah, and we so, just responded you know, to the Merrimack yeah. too. Absolutely. Right. Uh, recently, yeah. we've seen a lot of mutual aid to surrounding communities because they've had a problem. And to me, that's mutual aid. When it, Northampton had a problem, we sent the boat. And that's just the way it is. Yeah. You know, they, they would come down if we needed help, and they did this week. We saw that with the fire. This is mutual aid. I just had a question actually to go back to the replacement okay. equipment for the 14,000. So you said that you're going to. No, the 14,000, if you look at that, if I'm not mistaken, that's under communications. Right. That 14,000 is a, a beginning step for program replacement for portable radios. Okay. Now, tonight right. I talked to you about the right. fact that I want to go for a grant, but nothing says it will be successful. As we learned today from our FEMA um, yeah. guy, it's, he said that it's yeah, yeah. one in five. Um, if we get them, they still only go by seated riding positions, so we won't get all of them that we need. Mm -hmm. So I started a program replacement for portable radios here in that line. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I have nothing else. further. Sir. Anybody have any other questions? Nope. Comments? Concerns? Uh, wait a minute. I'm looking at my last, good job. last Thank page. You, sir. Oh, by the way, on the last page, uh, building maintenance, you've got pest control. Does that include humans? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have a, we have, go ahead and try it. <laughs> <laughs> we have concrete block buildings, but you'd be surprised at what we need to do down there at the beach and up yeah. here to, to keep the pests out, ants especially. Very nice budget, gentlemen. Thank Very you. Nice. So where do we want to go from here? Do we want to? I, uh, my own, I would just sort of hold off. That's fine. That's fine. I just want to see how the committee and yeah. stuff. The board wanted to do it, and we can uh, bring it yeah. back at a later time. Yeah. So. And we can change in that one page the higher amount of the grant that we just uh, that, accepted this morning. Because it went from. That doesn't so I actually discussed that with Ms. Pulliam about how we received that. And in the past, in 2008, there was an AFG grant that was received. What will happen is I'm going to notify the vendor yeah. that we want to make the purchase. And in doing so, we're going to say, move forward with this. And we have a quote. So as an example with the pagers, I'm going to move forward with that quote. It's about $17,000. Uh, when they get the equipment and then send it to us, they're going to then invoice us. Upon receipt of that invoice, I'm going to contact the federal government and say, disperse the funds in this amount. And then when they disperse the funds, it's going to go to the general fund and then be re removed and move, move back, I believe, right, Christy, to the grants line item at that point. So what will happen is the <coughs> general fund come back to the fire department after we rec uh, make a requisition, but it doesn't just come to us now that we've received it. They don't give us the money and let us grow the interest. They give it to us when we need to pay for something. Okay. So. Okay. Any other questions for the chief of deputy? No. Very, very nice job. Seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Have a great night. Thank you, ma'am. Next, we have Chief Sawyer. Uh -huh. Departmental update and Deputy Hobbs. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Deputy's going to hand out some copies of the uh, oh, quarterly update. And you're shooting those on to the budget committee as well. Thank you, sir. Right? I haven't been, no. Thank you, sir. They want them? Oh, yeah. I guess. I'll send them to them. I mean, Thank you. It should make things nicer when they're looking at your budget. They get yeah, their I can yeah, I can shoot them a copy. It's a public document. So. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, and this is going to be our third quarter report. That's July, August, and September. Our current staff level for full time is 35 sworn officers. On Labor Day, September 3rd, we concluded our summer season. Officer Jason Jackson, Matthew Robinson, and Vitaly Sorokins served as corporals throughout the summer. Corporals serve as the direct supervisors for our part-time special officers during our busiest times at the beach. Officer Robert Delato graduated from the 176th New Hampshire Police Academy on wow. August 17th uh -huh. and has returned to the P patrol division completing his field training program. Mm -hmm. Officer Howie Felch is currently attending the 177th New Hampshire Police Academy and is scheduled to graduate on December 14th. 
With the start of school in August, Officer Coy DeMarco and Officer Shannon Feely began their new assignments as SRO detectives uh, in the Hampton schools with SAU 90. Uh, Officer DeMarco is assigned up at the academy and Officer Feely is covering Center and Marston School. Our current part-time <coughs> staffing is at 33 Swan. The department began the season with 34 part-time officers and this number remained consistent throughout the summer. 12 of the part-time officers were working their first summer with the Hampton Police Department. The 12 new officers that started the summer was the largest class of new officers that the department has seen since 2013 when we hired 11. Wow. A part-time officer resignation uh, was received at the end of September, bringing the number down to 33. While this number is significantly lower than desired, it is encouraging our attrition rate appears to have slowed. Mm -hmm. Hampton PD has three new officer recruits attending the 276 New Hampshire Part-Time Academy scheduled to graduate November 9th. On October 7th, another part-time officer test was conducted which netted an additional eight new officer candidates. These eight new officer candidates along with three new officer candidates from the April test are tentatively scheduled to attend the 277th New Hampshire Part-Time Academy beginning in February of 2019. The department will also be inviting candidates to successfully pass the Great Bay Regional Test to participate in physical agility testing in an attempt to further bolster our part-time officer numbers for the 2019 summer season. Department operations. The department recently concluded a busy summer season. Going into the season, we had a number of challenges we were faced with, including staffing levels, the ongoing opiate crisis, and the levels of contacts the department was experienced with intoxicated <coughs> individuals. To offset our low staffing levels, we continue the program of augmenting with officers from area police departments. The use of officers from other departments will continue as public safety needs dictate. Special thanks to the New Hampshire State Police, Rockingham County Sheriff's Department, University of New Hampshire Police Department, <coughs> Epping Police Department, and Exeter Police Department, who all provided personnel and equipment to assist this summer. During the third quarter, we had four overdose deaths, bringing the total to seven for 2018. If you recall last year, we had a total of seven for the whole year, so we're already at that number. Yeah. Our detectives are working diligently trying to trace back the source of opiates coming into the community. This effort requires a regional approach, and we are consistently working with our federal, state, and local partners. The department continue, continues to have a detective assigned with the DEA Diversion Task Force, and we also participate in a grant partnership with the Portsmouth Police Department, Greenland, and Seabrook Police Departments. Basically, we cover the Route 95 corridor for the high-intensity drug trafficking area. The department continues to address the problem of intoxication and over-service alcohol by coordinating with the Hampshire Bureau of Liquor Enforcement for administrative follow-up. Whenever our officers encounter intoxicated individuals and are able to identify what establishment they were served at, the department has also provided office space to the investigator assigned to this area. Okay. Unfortunately, there is only one investigator for all of Rockingham County, so there's a little underhand so. in that area. So. We concluded our summer season on Labor Day, but immediately jumped into our event season with Seafood Festival. I would like to thank the New Hampshire National Guard 12th Civil Support Team, New Hampshire State Police Bomb Squad, <laughs> New Hampshire Homeland Security and Emergency Management, Seacoast Emergency Response Team, and the Seacoast Chief Fire Officer Association for providing personnel and or equipment that ensured a safe event. Other events included Reach the Beach, Grand State Wilman, and the Smutty Nose Rock Fest Half Marathon. While all of our events drew large crowds, traffic and security issues were managed well due to the level of cooperation and coordination between both public and private partners. Events and good weather continued through the month of September requiring additional staffing as needed. Each of the events that needed officers for traffic and security was required to hire officers on private detail. With the end of the summer season, the department has been in full swing with our fall training schedule. This training includes our own use of force and firearms training, but also our continued participation in the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Association. Officer Clay DeMarco received the pre uh, prestigious FBI Leader Trilogy Award for completing all three courses of the leadership series, and I believe that Hampton Police Department has the highest number of Trilogy Award winners Good. in the state of New Hampshire. Activity, our 2000, uh, that's a 16, I apologize, this should read 18, uh, 18 police activities compared to the same period Last year, July 1 to September 30, um, calls for service were up 6%, mm. motor vehicle stops up 10%, arrests down 27%, but concerning is our DWI offenses continue to rise, yeah. they were up 18% in that quarter. Drug offenses down 63%, incidents reported up 12%, 
offenses down 17%, felonies down 28%, parking tickets up 103%, and <laughs> accidents up 5%. So I'll entertain any questions from the board. Questions from the board, Mary Louise. Yeah, well, we were at the uh, ceremony this morning for the fire department to accept their check um, from FEMA. Uh, I did, uh, they were talking about the opioid crisis and was, and I did ask whether there is going to be some availability of counseling for uh, police and fire. Be de dealing with these things, it's bad enough that you're having to respond to all this mm -hmm. stuff. But uh, I, I was a little hopeful because Senator Hassan was there and tried to see if we can get some kind of funding for some kind of counseling or help uh, for first responders in both departments. Well, if I could jump in on that. Um, well, the, the, Hampton po the Hampton Police Department has a pretty strong history of being a leader in the region. Yep. Um, when Chief Maloney was killed up in Greenland, yep. we hosted all the meetings. We essentially ran that event to make sure it went right. Um, when the officer uh, was killed in Brentwood, because of the job we did, we were selected to be the host for all the meetings and help coordinate that response. Part of that response also includes dealing with the, the emotional side of it and dealing with uh, the effects of those things. And I have to give credit to the New Hampshire State Police. They, they initiated a great uh, program. Um, they have a, a trooper that his sole assignment is to travel the state of New Hampshire to not only deal with the state police when they deal with these issues, but to help out any other law enforcement agencies okay. that need it. So we married up with that group, and we, we've started our own peer support group, and we've utilized it. It's, uh, it's been very helpful because a lot of times when somebody goes through one of these critical issues, you don't see it immediately. Yeah. You don't see it for months sometimes where all of a sudden right. they've had time to decompress and think about mm -hmm. what actually occurred yeah. and what they were a witness to. And that causes significant effects to people. So uh, I am proud of the fact that that came from you know, the rank and file came to us Good. with this idea, and it sounded like a great idea, and we've been utilizing it, uh, I believe, to great great good in the department. So as far as funding from outside, there's not a lot available, I'll be honest. Is that, this applies just to the police department? Because I was thinking of fire and police this morning when I asked the question. Right now, we utilize it for the police, but we would also be willing, you know, if there's other, a lot of times when a, an issue hits an agency, you have to go outside the agency because it's so catastrophic mm -hmm. and that you need people from the outside to take a look at it and to help you through it. Mm -hmm. So in those type of issues, it really doesn't matter what discipline you come from. It's just understanding yeah. the concept yeah. of post-traumatic stress disorder and, and some of the mm -hmm. emotional impacts of some of these critical incidents that we witness as your public safety team. So The fire service has the Granite State CISD team, which is a number of firefighters mm -hmm both active and retired from throughout the state who do the same thing yeah. as, as he was just speaking. Right, because we did talk about that briefly this morning. And I, I'll <coughs> give you one uh, piece of information that I got from Senator Hassan that I don't know uh, if you already knew, but we were talking, she was talking about the op opioids and so forth. And she said a great deal of the uh, drugs are coming in from China via U.S. mail. China. The primary source of what we see now is not heroin, it's now fentanyl and carfentanyl. Mm -hmm. These are synthetic opiates. The components to make those products do come from China because it's very unregulated when it comes to handling yeah. those chemicals. But most of those chemicals come to Mexico and through Mexico into the United States. Now there are some direct uh, shipments that are now starting to occur, but it's much riskier for them to ship that into the United States because of our restrictions. Mm -hmm. When you have countries that don't have our level of enforcement and restrictions, yeah. that's where they bring it to make it. And most of the, the, the stuff that we're seeing comes up out of Mexico, right up Route 95, and mm -hmm. I'm not oh, giving away any big secret. It, <coughs> one community in Massachusetts that seems to have the biggest problem with it where it's become the center is Lawrence, Massachusetts. Um, so we work with the folks down there as much as we can yeah. trying to track if we have an issue here like a death we try to track those opiates back mm -hmm. utilizing DEA assets <coughs> to a particular dealer and it's a much more enhanced penalty particular if somebody dies yeah. so we do try to charge them federally if we can I just had a mental picture of your friendly local postman delivering you your, your box of, of opioids 
Oh, well. Well, we've had the issue because of the, the, the lethality of the, the drugs that we're seeing now. All the officers are issued masks that if we go into a car when we're doing a search, if you see any type of powdered substance, you're immediately back out. Good for you, yeah. We've had, we've had, there was a, we have a deputy from Rockingham County that had a problem when he went into a car and got contaminated with some carfentanil. I wouldn't have thought of that. Regina, no. do you have any questions? Ooh. Yeah, just about this whole opioid thing, it's really scary. And I know you guys do the possible best that you can do with, mm -hmm. you know, what you just described is exactly what's happening, I think. And, well, I know it's what's happening. And uh, I'm glad to hear you say that because one of those last three was a, a lifelong friend of mine mm -hmm. from Hampton. So uh, I can't even imagine what it must be like for police officers and fire yeah. officers that have like probably seen some of these people grow up, and then they have to you know go and I would handle say that. So saw my time as chief, many of the people that have succumbed to this have been people I knew because I grew up in this town, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're yeah, not exactly. bad. You know, and one of the things is people like to point the finger, and these are bad people. No, they're not. The people that maybe made a bad choice. But it, it's no less a health issue than if you have diabetes, yeah. and it needs to be. We need to look at it that way, and we need to treat it. And I think that's part of the problem we're, we're trying to grow into is the fact that you know, everybody wants to be tough on crime. Right. But like I say, you build a prison, we'll fill it. Is that really the answer we want? It's not the answer I want. Right. I'd rather see these people try to get them diverted into the drug courts mm -hmm. and try to get them the help they need because just walking everybody up is not working. Yeah. It's, it's not going to solve it. Well, they just get out and I mean, they, they can just do repeat. it again and they yeah. just get the whatever you guys have yeah. to you know, I've, I've knock told in to. Many rookie firefighters, many, many rookie police officers that grew up in this town, they have a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. The blessing is they grew up in this town. And when you can help somebody out and yeah. you help them out, they're like family and, you, and you're doing the best you can. The curse is you grew up in this town and you knew everybody. Mm -hmm. And when things turn to the yeah. crapper, you yeah. feel bad like they do. So, yeah. But, Rick? No, thank you for your report. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, thank you for the report and, and congratulations to you guys, both the chief and the deputy and all your people. They're doing a great job this summer. I mean, people have to realize that you go from 15,000 to probably the biggest city, city in, in, the, the state of in the state, you know, <laughs> yeah. during the summertime and that it, that it really puts a lot on you guys. And you do a great job and you handle it very well. Anytime down the beach or any place, the, the Hampton police really act professionally. Thank you. And they're really a great force and to be proud of. Mm -hmm. the, I just have one question on the DWIs, uh, up 18%. Is that because of more enforcement, more stops, or <laughs> too much serving at the establishments? I would say it's a combination of all of the above. I would say that with the, the growth that we keep talking about, the fire chief and I always, we talk about the growth and what, what you know, which is great. <coughs> we want to see people do well economically. But what are the negatives going to be that we're going to have to deal with? And so more people are coming to enjoy our entertainment venues, our dining, and our drinking establishments. So I think that's going to put a little bit more volume out on the street for us to deal with. And the other thing is, when you look at who we are as a department, um, we're very young, uh, and we're very eager, and we give these people great training. And they want to use that training to do their job. Mm. And I think when you see the increases of stops, I think each year as chief of police, I believe our number of stops has increased a little bit each year. I mean, this year, I think, what did I say, 10%, you know, for this quarter. And it's, it's because people are going out and doing their jobs. So if you stop more cars, you probably have a better chance, just numbers-wise, you're probably going to catch a few more people drinking. So I think it's a, a little bit of both. Mm. Good job. How are we at the... Uh uh, firing range. We we're in. The, we're still in the middle of that project. Uh, we had the uh, lead removed from the backstop, so that portion has been conducted. Uh, we're trying to get that to a uh, an industry standard of 20 feet on the backstop and 12 feet on the side berms. So we're working on that project. Public Works has been helping us out, but there's a certain level of screening that we have to have for the backstop, so there's no ricochet rounds. Um, and to try to keep what goes into the burn into the mm -hmm. backstop stays in the backstop. So that's the goal there. Good. And then the last stage of it uh, is going to be the fencing in outside of that proper footing area. We don't want to lose any of the lanes of fire because that works for us. That we have seven lanes of fire that we can use, and with the number of people we have to train, and, with, and we'll get into the budget in a minute about why we're asking for more training. We have a lot more younger 
people, it, people that aren't experienced carrying firearms. So that takes more work. And you really want that safety area that we have when we're up there training. So we want to maintain that, but make sure that we get those <coughs> industry standards of 20 feet on the backstop and 12 feet on the side. So that's going to take a little more work. I'm hoping we can complete that by uh, the new year, but if we don't, we can, we can catch up to it in the spring because most of the shooting stops. We'll be doing some fall firearms here pretty quickly. But after that, uh, if we have to wait till the spring, we'll wait till the spring. All right. I have another well, question, but it's not it's not on the um, the um, <coughs> department update. But <coughs> you weren't here when the lady came in. I watched. Time. I heard the comments. I was yeah. going to address that. Yeah, because um, <coughs> you know she did have some va very valid points, um, and then we all know that we hear all of this about the drag racing everywhere, <laughs> particularly on Ocean Boulevard now here and mm. probably I don't know where else, probably everywhere. Um, <coughs> So I just wanted to hear what you had to say about that. Yeah, I did catch the comments. Um, <laughs> you know, it's hard to take a different stance on that than what she said because there is some truth to what she said. Mm -hmm. There was also mis some misinformation. Um, the issue of speeding in the, in the community is a problem. We have it all over. Now, the problem we have is when somebody on Moulton Road has the problem, they're very hyper-focused on Moulton Road and don't understand. We've been down this path before because I've had community meetings with the folks out on Bachelor Road. I've had community meetings out on Tide Mill Road, other roads. We have this issue everywhere, and we only have a limited amount of resources. I did take a little offense to the fact that, you know, we've ignored. That, that just factually is not the case. Um, we have statistics. We've been out there stopping the cars. I thought it was a great idea when one of the sergeants came up with the idea of putting the car out there with a mannequin to at least slow people down. Mm -hmm. And what we routinely <coughs> do is when we put that car out, a short time later it's replaced with an actual officer in the car. Mm -hmm. We have to move around. I can't, I'd love to tell her that, yep, guaranteed 24-7 there will be an officer on your road. But what do I tell the people on High Street? What do I tell the people mm -hmm. on yeah. Mary Bachelor Road? Yeah. We have a limited number of resources and we manage them to the best we can and I think our statistical information bears that out. Um, and while I understood her description of some of the incidents, the most recent one, which I believe triggered her to come in, had nothing to do with speed. Um, there was an eyewitness to that incident where her dog was hit, not connected to the driver of the vehicle, <clears throat> and the dog broke loose from whoever was walking the dog oh. and ran out onto the trailer. It had nothing to do with the speed of the vehicle. The vehicle was not speeding. Yeah. We've investigated. There's no action being taken on anybody because it was a tragic accident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the unfortunate part, the part I really is really concerned, when people get upset with these things occurring, I understand that. I don't like it either. But to take things into your own hands is inherently dangerous. Like on that incident, oh yeah, that, that's just that's criminal. You don't want to do that, and you don't know who you're dealing with. You don't know why they're speeding, and to follow somebody like that—that that, that's just dangerous. You don't want to do that. In this incident, unfortunately, because they go so emotional, our witness was accosted by somebody in the neighborhood and accused of hitting the dog. It got confrontational. She stopped because she was a witness and wanted to give information, and she got confronted. That is just simply unacceptable way to handle these things. I get it, speeding's an issue. I share your concerns about it. But taking the law into your own hands, mm. especially something like speeding, yeah. is not the proper way to address this. And as far as the police department ignoring it, it's not been ignored. You may not like the fact that people speed in this town. I don't like it either. If you have a better solution as to how to stop speeding in the town of Hampton, I'm all ears. But we can't put speed bumps on every road those signs that we have were up there for a short period of time. We have five of those. We move those throughout the mm -hmm. community yeah. because we get the same complaints all over town. So when we have an area where we believe that we can make an effect with them, that's where we put them up. So during the summer months, we put them down closer to where all the traffic is, down towards the beach and that end. With the school season, they move them back up and around the schools to slow people down around our schools. Is there any um, possibility that the t school could uh, talk to the kids or issue some warnings that they shouldn't be drag racing out of the school if that's happening? Detective or? DeLuca <laughs> is a very busy man in that area. I have made stops myself. Uh, 
and let the, let the student know that uh, I will be bringing this up with the detective, and he follows up very diligently with it. It's just, let's keep in mind who we're talking about. We're talking about young teenage drivers, and we were all one of those at one time, and you don't always listen so well at that age. You, 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 well, you, detective you, DeLuca is very, uh, very capable because he stopped me. <laughs> on, uh, one on one. Um, so we do try to attack <coughs> the best we can in that area. If there's other er ways we can do it, we're certainly open to suggestion. We're open to meeting with anybody that wants to talk about it, talk to us about a problem in the neighborhood. But I don't want anybody giving the impression that if people call and complain about speeders, we're ignoring it. But we can't do anything about it after the fact. So if you let us know, we'll get out there and we will use things like the decoy cruiser, or as we call it, Officer Quint, Manny Quint. And who should the people ask for if they do want to call and have a discussion? You can ask to speak to the shift supervisor or the deputy chief because he runs okay. the operational issues and he makes those sets of assignments. Okay, great. And if you're not satisfied, call and ask for me. Okay. If you're not Thank satisfied you. by him, though, I'm, I'm amazed. sure he's fair. <laughs> can I say one thing on sure. that? Sure. I don't think to. I don't really think, to be honest with you, that there is anything more that you guys could possibly do as far as yeah. you, like you. It's exactly what you say, Chief. And I think that it's just another reason why this town has just developed so much. And mm -hmm. it's like what the yeah. fire chief said <coughs> a few weeks ago. And I mean, there is more cars. If you go around and you look at any neighborhood in this town, there are no more people there. Yeah. Whether the houses, it's just, and we yeah. have the same roads. And the people that are here now might not, you know, they may not have been here for very long. and. Maybe they think they can bomb, you know, 45, 50 miles an hour through the roads, but they're not used to, you know, we have families here that, you know, may let their kids ride their bicycles to school. And yeah. unfortunately, it's something that you're going to get called about. And like you're saying, I mean, you're not, like, what is it that you can do? I mean, I can understand the cruiser thing 100%. I mean, because I know if I see a cruiser sitting on a road, I tend to probably slow down before I can well, tell whether or not there's an actual My daughter thinks it's pretty funny because I keep waving and it's the mannequin, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> right? So, I mean, hopefully maybe people that live here now will realize that, you know, to try to slow down a little bit, especially when you're going... Because it's not just kids. It's no, it's not. It's that adults. live in the neighborhoods every uh, single day. I we get that. a lot of the highway safety grants, and i got to be honest, you know, we have forms we have to fill out, and very rarely do I check off the box that it's somebody under the age of 18 driving it's usually an adult wait for work <laughs> um, the other thing I would I would caution people we certainly you know with this issue being raised you'll probably see an increased presence um, on those roads in the area and invariably when this happens what happens is the people we wind up stopping are the people from that neighborhood <laughs> yeah because they're the ones doing it well we get relaxed we all get relaxed in our own environment I'm a little bit more cautious when I'm driving on a road I don't know when I get back and more something more familiar, I'm probably not as cautious, and I think hey, we all suffer from that yeah. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And invariably, when we do these enhanced patrols, we wind up grabbing some of the very people that complain or their neighbors. Uh, so that's yeah. one of the things, and when we do this, I kind of have a standard rule. If we're gonna go in and we're gonna do this, I'm not gonna tell an officer he can't give a warning, but he's gonna have to come in and explain to me why he gave a warning. Yeah. So he's more than invariably, I think I'm a nice guy to talk to, but apparently they don't share it because they write a lot of tickets. Uh, <laughs> so that's what happens. If we're, we're going to go in, we're going to go in, and we're going to write tickets to make, make the impact. So just, just very quickly, I'll just say that the decoy does work. I was the one that requested High Street go from 35 to 30, and I was going down the High Street the other day, and that decoy was there, and I was doing 36. <laughs> well, and, and the I credit, right I, I like to give credit where credit is deserved. That was Sergeant Jones' uh, initiative. Uh, and it's been working very well. <laughs> well. It looks a lot like him. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for bringing that up. I, I did want to touch on that. I did see that. So. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, emergency management. The topic of emergency management. Were you talking? Were we doing budget tonight, or Where was it just a discussion? I'm, I'm on the, uh, the agenda. Budget. It was. Well, I'm in the budget. Where well, I'm in the going? agenda. Yeah, emergency management. The agenda. A, article B was. You would, you would talk last week or a couple weeks ago about maybe possibly coming up with some new ideas with with numbers. Well, first of all, with numbers, we have to have a budget. Uh, we've been operating for a th on a thousand dollar budget since I've been in this police department, and it's just not realistic because that just means we're taking the money from somewhere else, and we need to really measure the impact of emergency management and all that comes with it. And how do we measure that in a municipality? We measure it by dollars and cents. So my recommendation to the board is we do get a, um, 
a stipend from the state for our participation in the Seabrook drills every quarter, which comes to just over $12,000 per year. And I'd recommend we take that equivalent amount of money and put it into the budget and utilize that as our jumping off point. So right now that goes into the general fund when we get it back? When we get reimbursed, it goes into the general fund. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good idea. Makes and sense so that. is there a way we can take it out of the general fund if we, if we do this for that? It goes into the general fund. It goes in as revenue in the budget that you have in front of you tonight for emergency management is the twelve thousand is it twelve thousand four eighty four I think right? four sixty four yeah four sixty four so we put that on the expense side so it would be a wash right now it's we're receiving although, the money and it's although it says up a thousand percent it will still be a wash correct because of the revenue yeah. is coming in he is correct right now the revenue comes in and just goes in as general fund revenue now it will be used to offset these expenses. Okay. Okay, so that explain that? So it's like a wash. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so then I guess we do the yard budget. <coughs> we'll start with administration. Any questions on the administration? I don't have any questions on that part. I do. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Over overtime wages, 4017 4000 something, 5000 in the budget, and going up to eighteen. That was a result of consolidation. It's not, it's, it's an increase there, but a decrease somewhere else. We have um, our IT folks uh, in-house that are trained, and we used to take that out of from whatever, if they were a detective, it came out of detectives. If they were a patrol, it came out of patrol. And if it was a lieutenant, it came out of those lines. It's another one of those things where we want to get a better read on what are we actually spending on that, so we consolidate it, and that's the number we use utilizing to cover those costs when, uh, Lieutenant Gaditis gets called and he has to come in on a Sunday to reset the system or, you know, mm -hmm. Officer Jackson drives up yeah. from Havel to do the same thing because Tommy's on vacation. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, two primaries right now. We're probably going to train up a couple more just so if the system has a problem, we have people that can immediately get to it and get it uh, rectified. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, like, uh, crime control and investigation, that, that overtime is down 22.5%. Yes. So, in that, so that's how you... Yeah. I just we just move the numbers around. Yeah. It's not you know it's it's a it's an increase in that line, but not the overall number. Okay. okay. And, any That's other good. questions? I have a question on yep. consultants. Uh, three nine two zero, one forty four to three thousand. Fitness for duty exams. We think we just touched on it a little bit with Mary Louise and her and her topic is. We're finding that we need to every time we have a critical incident. Um, mm -hmm. We had an incident. Uh, year before last where one of our officers was shot at. Yeah. Every officer involved, I ordered them to go for a fitness for duty exam. Yeah. It's hard because of who we are trying to admit that you're struggling or having a problem with something. Yeah. So the blanket rule is if there's a critical incident and you're witness or party to it, you're going off to talk to somebody just to make sure you're okay. Mm -hmm and any follow-ups we would provide. So we are just seeing an increase in that uh, because we're trying to be more diligent in protecting our employees, so mm -hmm. that's why that increased. And that's smarter than waiting for somebody to ask for help. They're, they've got an out because they're being told. Again, I'll, I want to give credit where credit is due. This came from the rank and file, putting together that team of people and, and getting got folks to open up yep. to the concept of yep. we're all human and we're all going to have yep. our issues with things and trying to take better care of our people. <clears throat> Anything else under administration? No. Nope. Okay. Crime control and investigations. Any Just questions? right away, regular wages, 12%. Is that contractual? That's all contractual matters. Okay. Uh, and we did add, although Christy, you can answer me, with the additional SRO being funded by the SAU. I think it's still in there, though. That's still in there. Okay. So that is an ad, yes. Yep, that's an ad. But it's contractual plus the additional person that's carrying a detective's badge in the schools. Okay. I'm good. Any other questions? I got one question on this sure. one. On part time rate wages, I just know we have the same, you have the same amount as you did last year. But as of this right now, it's zero. Part time wages? For the second line under crime control? Oh, okay. Yeah, what that is, if, if you recall, there's no increase. That was uh, Mr. Mills. We uh, brought him on as a part-time evidence tech, which oh, has been yeah. a great asset okay. to the department. 
Um, again, he's a retired postmaster who are the most organized people in the world, and that's exactly what you need in an evidence room. So the use of part-time people in certain areas, um, especially with that type of skill set, has been a great benefit to the department. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm in, I, because I'm going to the printed pages, and you guys are working off this. I well, have, you can, I'll try to work off both. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> no, I just uh, on uh, 42101, 6100, um, you haven't increased the prisoner food. No, um, quite frankly, we, uh, our rule of thumb is if we can't get them bailed out of that building within a four hour period, they go west of the county jail. It's <laughs> just, it's a, it's a risk management tool. It's the longer, the more time we spend in our lockup, the greater risk we have of being sued for something that could happen. Um, so the sooner we can get them out of our facility, we do. So the word is passed that if you go to jail in Hampton, you'll starve unless you get Yeah, you're not getting any food from me. <laughs> I think it's been $100. It's been $100 since before I was with this department. It was $100, I think, a night. I think that started back in 1985. And I used to go up to Garland's to get the stale donuts in the morning for the people that get billed out in the morning. So if you remember what Garland's was. Oh, yeah. luxury. Oh, dear. Any other questions on... Wait a minute, because I've got to, I'm trying to correlate yep, no where you are. Where's the... Well, if, you, if you've got oh, a line and you want to... Are you in 42102? Yeah, we're Crime control investigation. Right. Yes. Yeah, and mounted, I have a... I think I asked you this two years ago, but you're going to be really, really nice to me this time. And that if wasn't you the last have time. an A to put in... Um, <clears throat> instead of farrier, you're going to put farrier for me, really, because I don't think you're ferrying the horses across the river. So you got me on the I same spot. <laughs> I think we've been. I think See, we've been here before. I met with the deputy. So you're going to find this, and he said leave it in there. So you you're going to find an A for me <laughs> for next year's budget, okay. right? Okay. Well, I, I might have the deputy do the budget next year, so we'll see if he has the same sense of humor. You know, so you got to watch out. I don't have anything else. All right, traffic control and patrol. Yep. I'm good on this one. Any questions? Yep. Training. Training and recruitment. Twenty-five to forty-five. That's the one you were gonna. You noticed I, I highlighted in my report the number of tests yeah. we're running and the different things we're doing. What that necessitates is, instead of when I came out of this department, they tested once a year and it was six hundred people would show up. Now you're lucky if you get a hundred people to you know to sign up, and you're lucky if you get seventy to show up and actually test. So that means we have to test more frequently. And part of the thing we do is, if you pass it, we have to have practice for the test. We additionally have to have people <coughs> and do the PT training. So that means I have to have people that are certified by the state to conduct the PT testing. So instead of doing that twice a year, I mean once a year, we're doing that two, maybe three times a year, and then we also bring in people from that other Great Bay test because they tested the same way, the same day we did. So we have to run an additional test. So the things we're having to do to get people in the door that are suitable for our needs has increased. It's just the cost of doing that business is getting more expensive because when you look at us, we're hiring part-time officers. When you look at a city like Manchester or Nashua, mm -hmm. they're hiring full-time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're constantly getting mm -hmm. depleted by these people rating us. Uh, there's not, nothing we can do about it. We can't get in the way of somebody going from part-time to full that we're constantly having to do this over and over again. So if we have a short year and we just need more bodies, we'll even go to the point of, if you fail the PT test within a certain range, we'll bring you back mm -hmm. in a month and let you test again. But I have to have certified people that oversee that. So that's the primary cost, trying to do more advertisement um, and just trying to reach out and get people in the door. I know it's a lot of money, but we did have some success. We had the largest class we've had since 2013, and the good thing is we haven't lost any of them yet. Yeah. Now, we will. Um, I anticipate we're going to have some retirements full-time next year. So hopefully we get to grab some of those folks ourselves. But trust me, I know Rochester PD is down 30 officers right now as we speak. They're going to come knocking because they know the product we produce. They're going to be looking for 
Hampton part-timers. When they see that on somebody's application, they're working for Hampton, they tend to go to the top of the pot. Um, so we have to be prepared for that, and this is just one of the things we have to do is increase our spending in that area. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm, no, I'm fine through the end of the budget. It's a very well put together budget, very clear. I don't have any problems or questions. Do you want to talk about support services? I do one question on yep. that. Um, outside agencies, Chief, that you yep. implemented a couple of years ago now to bring in officers when we need to fill the positions from yes. other communities, that is a line item that I think we should be totally reimbursed for by the state of New Hampshire. <laughs> just, just my <laughs> thoughts. Oh, yeah. I'm totally fine with what yeah. you want for a budget on that. But yeah. That is more of a political decision. Yeah. I understand your feelings on it. Just understand when I come up with the approaches we're going to take, I don't look at those things. I look at we have a job to do, right. and we're no. going to do it, and I'll let you folks take care of how that's going to get funded. I have faith in you guys. You guys will get something done with that somehow. Yeah. Um, my job is to get it done for you, and you guys give us the support we need by helping us through the budget. And process. you always do. Yep. Appreciate that. And you that. had to spend forty-five thousand dollars last yes. year. I didn't <laughs> increase that line simply uh, this year. We've we've gone over the last two years, but I didn't increase it because I'm hoping we've turned a corner uh, with the the twelve we had. We've maintained them. We got a pretty good crop right now going through, and I want to give it a chance to work. Because my goal is this. These people that come in and help us, they're great. They're a great mm -hmm. asset, and we have to work together. But if I can put more Hampton Green out there, then mm -hmm. I want more Hampton Green yeah. because there are people. We've trained them, yeah. and that's the goal I go to. So I'm, I'm hoping this is a year we turn the corner. And if we do go over a little, there's always some in, in the other line items that didn't get spent, either the full-time coverage of part-timers or the part-timers themselves. So it's one of those budgets that has to have a little a little yeah. room of margin of error in. But that one, I, tight, I kept it tight. Thank you, Chief. Radio maintenance from 20 to 30. That's just a look at where we are with the radio systems. One of the things, um, which one, Jim, what line are you talking about? Uh, da, 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 42105, 43110. Okay, yeah. What we did there is we're trying to get into a habit like we, uh, you know, I've described with the cruisers. When we trade in a cruiser every third year that's a frontline patrol cruiser, we also get a new computer with it. Oh. Obsolescence of technology, okay? Uh, uh, uh. Some of the radios we carry today that are, are issued, if they go down, they can't, be they can't be replaced with the same model and they can't be worked on anymore because they don't have the bench equipment to work on that model. They're that old. So in order to stay ahead of that, I built into the budget that we're gonna try to purchase six new radios every year to cover that obsolescence that we're experiencing with radios because when they go down, they're down and I have to go buy a new one anyhow. So if I build it into the budget, as those things go down, we just go into the shelf, we don't have to wait for it to be delivered, yeah. and the officers may, we can do it that night. But if a radio dies that night, a lieutenant can walk into that room, take the serial number down, put it in there that's okay. assigned to the officer, and the officer's up and running again in 10 minutes. So that's the goal. Okay. Thanks. I'm fine with everything else. Police station and buildings? Mm -hmm. no. No. Okay. We're all set for police budget. Animal control. More, more yeah. motion or? No, we'll, we'll, do it, we'll, okay. like, we'll do it like we did the, pl the fire yeah, one and do it the, the next um, time. <coughs> before, take, be, well, before, before. We still Chris, have two other budgets, though. So. Oh, we do? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we have. Uh, Are you leaving, Christy? Or? No, I'm waiting. Oh. <laughs> we have animal control. Oh, okay. I forgot about it. Who could forget our animal control? Office? It used to be easier when we just called it repeat. You know, but it really doesn't go with Tony, so. Um, yep. I don't think we had any substantial increases. The in overtime that. was up a little bit. Okay. It is. Um, yeah. The area of that, I would say, is uh, I was actually with him Sunday when he got a call. And we have a good relationship with um, the folks out there in Epping with that Raptor group. Uh, you may have remembered Tony rescued a snowy owl off the side of 101. Uh, the fishing game couldn't catch it. Tony walked, just walked down with a blanket and grabbed it. Um, <laughs> saved the great one owl. So we're doing, even though that's not his primary responsibility, it's more the, the domestic animals. It's one of those things. People, as we see with animals, call. Yeah. And I don't feel... 
that we should be saying no to them. It's one of those things. I think it breeds um, a trust in government that when there's something, you know, an animal that's injured, that we're going to try to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Try to help if other if there aren't other assets available. Uh, so Tony has created a great uh, working relationship with the folks in Fish and Game. Uh, they've actually created a, a regional association now of animal control officers because as a lot as we learned after Pete retired, there were more things that we needed to be doing as far as training and certifications, which yeah. we accomplished with Tony. Yeah. So some of it is training, but a lot of it is just the nature of calls. We've been going out to try to help people. It's we go out if somebody gets a bat in the house. Is that really an animal control problem? But a lot of our people, let's face it, in this community, we're getting older, and they want somebody to help them, and they want somebody to help mm -hmm. them now. <laughs> and I, I just don't feel it's right for us to say no when <laughs> Tony's pretty capable in those areas of dealing with, you know, domestic is his primary thing. But he took the time to do the training dealing with some of the wildlife issues mm -hmm. that we utilize his skill set in that area. So it is a little bit more over time. Mm -hmm. Supplies and expenses, you were up a little bit too. Some of the equipment we had when we transitioned from Peter to Tony had been with Peter since he'd been with the department 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah. So all we're doing is updating some of the, the have a hot traps and stuff like that, uh, things like that, and new uniforms for Tony and Jack. So we just want to make sure that the, the appearance is professional and we upkeep our equipment mm -hmm. that we're utilizing with the animals. Rusty? Yep. Yeah, on, on that subject, when uh, Tony first took over, I had a couple of people call and say they had phoned in because of whatever it was, dog mm -hmm. in the neighborhood or something. And they were told that he, uh, he, he didn't work overtime, that he couldn't respond. But now, so now you do, you're being a little more flexible? Yeah, we, we're just seeing, I don't know why it is, we're just seeing a greater demand for those services. Mm -hmm. uh, people, um, I, I think we have so many people that move here from other places that yeah. don't deal with yeah. what we deal with in New Hampshire. We, we're a community of 15,000. But I took a walk with Tony. We went out off of uh, Toll Farm Road looking for this great horn owl on Sunday. Yeah. And it was a hike getting in the back there, out behind the power oh, farm sure. and, and all that area. Oh, we yeah. still have a lot of areas where we do have a lot of game and wildlife. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes fish and game just can't respond because they're spread yeah. out so thin across the state. Yeah. And they literally have no overtime. Yeah. Um, Pete McKinnon was always there when you <laughs> called him, and, and we were spoiled. But uh, I'm glad that there's, there's a little more flexibility. And I will say that a local vet uh, where I bring my cats, uh, I asked how they're doing, and they said that he's very polite. They really like him very much. Mm -hmm. They were very happy to see him, you know, as the animal control officer, and that made me feel very good. That's good to hear. He's a great guy. He's very mm -hmm. friendly, and, and especially where we're dealing with a lot of people that mm -hmm. they don't know who else to call. I mean, you can call somebody, but one mm -hmm. of the closest ones that I know, just know because a friend of mine called him, is out of Barrington, New Hampshire. Yeah. If they're available, you get a bat in your house or a squirrel gets loose or something yeah. like that. Is that truly what an animal control officer does in every community? Probably not, but I think in this community it's yeah. the right thing to do. Yeah. So. Now do we do parking administration of this too? Yes, sir. Next half. So. Are we all set? We're all, we got parking administration okay. now. I don't so. have a problem. So we had a discussion uh, regarding parking administration and the possible uh, consolidation of the parking lot operation with the enforcement operation that exists in the police department. Mm -hmm. I just think moving forward dealing with growth issues and not seeing that that's going to end anytime soon and wanting to manage these issues to the best benefit of the taxpayer and I think we've shown that I mean our revenues are up substantially through our enforcement action I haven't seen the numbers for the parking lot I know we had a pretty wet and dismal season but I still think we're going to be up a little uh, and we still have a few shows to go um, I just think the best thing we could do is to consolidate those to get an mm -hmm. idea of what the parking situation here is in Hampton and to have somebody that you know under either the police department or wherever you folks want to put it, uh, create a parking division for the town of Hampton. Uh, similar to what we do with animal control. Animal control is not in the police department budget. It is a separate budget. Create a budget that, consult that takes those items and puts it together so we can get a handle on the parking revenue and the parking situation as a whole in this town. I think it would just suit the town better. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah, that concerns? Would definitely, that that whole budget would be covered easily by the revenue, the parking revenue that we oh, yeah. bring in, right? Um, yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, would I think be. that's oh, a yeah. good idea. Yeah. I think it's a good idea too. To, yeah. to do I'm that. more concerned with the functionality. I mean, revenue is a good thing. Yeah. I just, <clears throat> as a police officer, I, I try to steer away from be, us being revenue collection agents. Revenue is part of the afterthought of it, but is parking managing the parking lots. That's why um, we have to have a separate budget, I think. But consolidating those two entities as, into one, I think, is the is the better move for us. I just want to make a comment on this. I think it's a good idea too. Yeah. I think the police yeah. department did a really good job this summer. This summer, and yeah. right now you still are. The lots are open, and also like, so we spent roughly through 831 about a hundred grand I mean easily that's going to be covered I by mean, what should come in so you know it is going to be an increase but I think over time we had to spend parking we had, lot revenue will yeah. increase once you figure out exactly like what you got to do when you got to do it things like that right we had to spend a little money this year simply because right. of the flooding we experienced there was damage done like all the safes had to be replaced mm -hmm. and we adopted a new uh, accounting system through finance for the money and the way it happened yeah. so we had to buy some money bags little <laughs> items like that eventually we yeah. want to see us try to replace uh, the shacks that we have down there with those are going to have to be replaced eventually and to me having worked down there grown up down there you want you see what people are doing with their watch you want those to be inviting mm -hmm. you want them to look clean you don't want them to look like just some box we threw up there with doors and you want it to be a place that our that our employees feel safe to work in so again giving credit where credit's due lieutenant giddley spearheaded it this year our first summer and i thought he did an outstanding job just danny you know really thinking of how to maximize the revenue but also how to make this more functional for the employees and I, I think he did a bang up job with that so and I th again I think we and we've talked about it in the past is going to some automation we've explored that I, I did uh, write a memo to the uh, to the deputy town manager on some thoughts on that um, we just hadn't had a chance to formalize that to share with you folks I'll try to get that out to you as quickly as I can uh, there is, it, it depends on the degree of automation you want to do we can buy some of those basic ones where you have your credit card, you slide it in, you hit the button, or it hits the button, spits the ticket out, and you're done. You just put the ticket in the window. And we set a rate for the day, and it's programmable, and if we have to change the rate during the day, we just change the rate and you put it up on the sign. Wow. It's that simple. And it, it, one of the things I think Christy will support me on this, what auditors like is less people handling the money. Right. <laughs> okay, that's just not accusing anybody of anything. It's just the way it is. The fewer people handling the cash, yeah. the better off it is. Yeah. Right. Um, so the greater degree that we could automate uh, is certainly an area I would try to steer that ship. Um, and certainly I think it's worthy we start having a discussion of the town getting its fair share of revenue from our own entities. I know some people haven't liked it, but I've had a lot of talks with people at the beach about the potential of seasonally putting pay, to, uh, pay and display mm -hmm. on the leaded streets down at the beach. Mm -hmm. It's time. Yeah. Everybody else is, you know, the problem is, is you have property owners that are taking their cars and parking them out on the street right. so they can park them in their driveway and making money on it and I that just gives me a, I, I see it it gives me a little bit of heartburn because I grew up down there and you know we're, we're doing everything we can to make things functional for the business people but the town should be getting its its due also for the parking issues so I think those are issues worthy of discussion also moving forward and that would be if we consolidate this You'd, you'd have a place where you could put that and move forward with it if that's what the will of the board was to move towards a, a pay and display on the side streets. Yeah. Yeah, I think you should do it a, a down, a down on the numbered streets too. Uh, yep. it, it's time has come. There's too many yeah. people taking advantage and it's uh, causing a lot of problems it within is. The, where yeah. the people live. I agree. Good. Any other no. sub accounts that we have? I think that's all the hats I, I got. I think that is. So <laughs> how many years have you worked here? I'm in, I came here in 95, part-time, full-time in 96, so 22. And Garland's was still there? Gar oh, yeah, Garland's there. <laughs> well, before, I, I knew Garland's better before than I worked here, but we're not going to have that talk tonight. <laughs> that was there for so many years, really, when you think about it. There is still not really a place like that. There isn't. Well, I managed well, Dudley's for a number of years. Yeah. The family that runs Dudley's on the top of uh, C Street. Yeah. Uh, they're family friends, so I managed that for a number of years, so that was where I always got my morning coffee. Yeah, I know in um, 1963 <laughs> when we moved here, we went to Garland's all the time. I still remember the day. Garland's lunch in it is about yeah. the closest <laughs> thing we have. So. I lost yeah. a $20 bill one day. My mother made me stay out all day looking for it <laughs> <laughs> on the way down there. Yeah. Yes, I, I'm going to, if we're pretty well set yep. on this now, and while the chief and deputy are here, I'm just going to ask you for a moment or two of personal privilege. 
My first working, uh, I first started working with the Hampton Police Department in 1978. And when I look back, seeing what you brought forward tonight and how the department has, has grown, um, we had police officers in 78, 79, 80, some spe mostly specials who had never fired a weapon. We also had some officers who were Vietnam veterans who went around with a weapon here and a weapon there and a <laughs> weapon in the, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we, um, I, I, you just explained to us uh, a short time ago about the cleaning the lead from the uh, casings over at the range. And of course, there was no such thing as a range in those days. But we decided that it was time after I spent time in the sand pits in Brentwood with the uh, officers, we decided it was time for a range in this town. I think that has been so, so successful. Um, some of us walked along Elaine Street and explained to the neighbors that they might hear some gunfire going off, but it was worth it because we had to give training to our police officers. And when I look at how you have grown as a department, what I, if I could have imagined sitting here tonight, 40 years ago, when I just was introduced to the Hampton Police Department, I am so proud of what's happened in the intervening years. So I, I think uh, everybody deserves a lot of credit. And it was, uh, a, was and is a passion of mine to make sure that this department and the fire department really succeeded. And you've succeeded beyond my, beyond my wildest dreams, and this is incredible. Well, thank you, and that does bring to light. I forgot to mention that Officer Delato when he graduated from the academy, I believe came out top gun, mm -hmm. top shooter. So we have a nice. strong history in the town of Hampton as being the top shooting police officers at the police academy and our instructors are up there frequently instructing. So having your own range and the ability to train people properly pays dividends. And think of the risk to the town in the old days when people had, weren't trained Carried use their own guns. Yeah. <laughs> they did. They carried yeah. their own guns back then. I started. I did. And, you know, and the that, world. The world has changed. <laughs> nice young man that you're referring to just now. Uh, I mentioned to one of your officers one day. I just happened to see him, and I asked how the young man is doing, and he said, "Oh, great. He takes after his mother." <laughs> <laughs> Jim. And I but just before oh, Christy God. leaves, we're finished with budget right now, right? Yep. I know, and I don't want to bring it up now and talk about it, but we were all given the audit. Right. And I was talking to Christy, and Christy said that the auditors could come in with no extra costs to the town good. and go over the audit. And I think that's a good idea Excellent. so that people can understand what's in the audit yeah. and what makes it up. So. Yeah, and I wanted to mention in regards to that and the budget, both the budget and the audit are online in their normal location under the finance department document. So if anyone's looking or requesting that. Could um, you see if we could get them to come down sometime in November? I can see what I can do. Yes. They'll, they'll be happy to come down. It's just a little bit challenging to coordinate. So as right. long as you guys are flexible with whatever money I can get yep. um, yeah. after we're done with budgets or whatever, I would assume yeah. would Good. be best. Yep. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So you gentlemen, just remember where you came from and the, the fight and the hard work all along the way to get you to where you are now. And we're very proud of you. No, this. we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very, thank you very much. much. Next thing we have is Aquarian Water Company with a quarterly update. Uh -huh. I see Carl McMorrin and John Hurley. John Hurley. And Dan Lawrence. And Dan Lawrence. John, nice job on sending us the updates on the PFOAs. That's Thank that you very job. much. Very nice job. This will work. <laughs> are we on? No. <laughs> it's not showing up yet, but you are. 
Oh, here it goes, maybe. Oops. Maybe I'll get the course. Yeah. Should they just show up, Christy, do you know? <coughs> I had to have a special adapter, so I don't know if this is the one you need or not. Well, I checked it with the guy. And okay. He said, yeah, just plug well, it in. Nathan and Lenny had a problem the other night, and yeah, they were yeah, told, told me there was something <laughs> under the... I think he's good now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Ryan. Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Yes. Yes. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> yes, for a quarterly update. You know who I am, Carl McMorrin, John Hurley, uh, Dan Lawrence. Um, these are all the things we want to hit on. We are uh, proposing a water rate reduction, and we're going to give some <coughs> highlights, updates on the PFAS well 22 and uh, the main replacements this year. So you did hear me right. We are proposing a water rate reduction. Um, the number will be 2.65%, <clears throat> which is a little bit higher than what I shared with some of you earlier because we did file today with the Public Utilities Commission, so oh. this comes right out of the filing. Wow. The credit goes to the federal corporate tax reduction, uh, oh. which basically reduces the amount of taxes the company has to pay, which is essentially a reduction in expenses, so we don't need as many revenues. Therefore, we're proposing a rate Good heavens. Uh, reduction to account for that. And it's offset slightly by the uh, Mill Road main replacement mm -hmm. project of this year. So what that means is currently those of us with water bills, uh, we see a 7.08% mm -hmm. surcharge on there for, the, for WICA. And it's going to go down, it was proposed to go down to 4.43%. Um, Carl, it, would you say what WICA is? It's the uh, Water Infrastructure and Conservation Adjustment. Uh, <laughs> it's designed for uh, temporary interim uh, rate rate increases uh, yep. to basically help us address our share of the aging infrastructure, uh, which is mainly replacing water mains. Mm -hmm. In the six years that it's been in place, we've spent almost $5 million on main replacements, and that's replaced about 16,000 feet of water mains. So mm -hmm. it's a significant effort uh, to help preserve and enhance the reliability of water service here in town. And these numbers obviously are contingent upon the PUC's final approval. Hopefully, they'll be effective uh, come January. Wow. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hurley. Good evening. And uh, I'm here to provide the PFAS update. And we have test results in from the samples collected <coughs> in July and August. I think you'll recall the primary operating feature of the second quarter was that we did the pump test on the new Well 22 primary feature for the third quarter is the high summer demands and we needed to put well six back in service and that is reflected in our test results um, you may recall that uh, we had taken well six out of service in mid-august of 2017 and it remained off through the remem remainder of 17 until uh, sometime in uh, late june of 18 okay and so we had it on for a little more than two months this summer. We needed it in order to meet the uh, higher demands. Can you advance one slide? So uh, this is the uh, graph of just PFOA plus PFOS, the two uh, PFAS compounds that are regulated. And you can see that they're all uh, less than 10 here. Uh, uh, with the exception of this one result here, but essentially uh, 10 or less across the whole system. Uh, again, six points in the distribution system. The, the, the first three, uh, Tide Mill, Exeter Road, and Mill Road, uh, get primarily uh, water from the Mill Road wells, and they're in Hampton. And then Maple Road and Fire Station are in Northampton, and uh, Rye Store is in Rye. Uh, so relative to the two regulated compounds, 10 parts per trillion or less compared to the current uh, limits from EPA and NHDES of 70. Let's go to the next slide. This slide covers the total PFAS. We're testing for 26 compounds. 
in uh, some of the uh, <coughs> railroad uh, water, we do detect eight or nine compounds. The, the uh, Northampton water, it's more like uh, three or four compounds. Uh, but here you can see the influence of well six pretty clearly. Uh, so like this orange uh, bar here uh, representing July, again here and again here. More Mill Road uh, water in the system in July and then the light blue bar to the right uh, reduced the amount of Mill Road water in August as the demands decreased. Uh, nonetheless, uh, still well below the 70 limit that the uh, EPA and DH, uh, DES have set just for PIPO and PIPAS. Um, and so they remain, our, our levels remain well below any uh, current and anticipated standards. Can you move back two slides, please? Okay, so I think you're all aware that legislation passed uh, this past session to uh, direct New Hampshire DES to develop enforceable standards for four PFAS compounds. Currently, there are action levels, advisory levels. Mm -hmm. So in 2019, uh, we're going to have uh, enforceable standards called maximum contaminant levels for the four PFAS compounds that I've indicated there. Mm -hmm. uh, we already have the advisory levels for PFO and PFAS, and then they're going to add PFNA, mm -hmm. which we do not detect in the treated water, so that'll okay. be a zero. And PFHXS, we do detect, but on the order of one to two parts per trillion. Okay. So Carl, if you could go to the next slide. So this is the PFOA and PFAS slide. Uh, when we add PFNA at zero, <laughs> it'll be the same. And when we add PFHXS at a one to two parts per trillion, those bars are gonna look essentially mm -hmm. the same. They'll be one or two parts per trillion higher still essentially 10 parts per trillion or less, okay? We don't know where New Hampshire DES is going to set the enforceable standards, but uh, given what uh, New, New Jersey has done, what New Jersey has been pretty conservative, they set a limit of uh, 14 just for PFOA, and we're under that for all four of these that are gonna be regulated. They've set a le level of 13 for PFAS, so now you're up to 27 for the total. And PFNA, they're looking at a 13, I believe, so you're up to 40, all right? We're, we're less than 10. Mm. So that, that's the picture in the uh, water that's uh, delivered to the customers. <coughs> uh, back one slide. Okay, and then this week, uh, as part of that regulatory process, DES is holding a series of three meetings, public meetings, uh, to get input on uh, how to go about uh, setting these uh, enforceable health standards for the four PFAS compounds. And uh, part of that input will be very technical input from mm -hmm. toxicologists and epidemiologists and health professionals, et cetera, okay? So, you know, what's to be considered, what kind of weighting should be given to children versus adults, that type of thing. Uh, and so we continue to implement our PFAS reduction strategy. Uh, uh, continue to uh, minimize the use of well number six. So like I mentioned, uh, this year we only had it on for a little more than uh, two months. Yeah. Last year we took it out of service mid-August, so that's seven and a half months last year, down from seven and a half to two. And prior to 2017, well six was in use essentially 12 months a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we continue to <laughs> Uh, reduce PFAS levels by keeping uh, well number six, which has the highest level of total PFAS, keeping it out of service as long as we can. Uh, secondly, uh, we an anticipate uh, getting approval to utilize the new well, well 22, sometime in 2019. Mm -hmm. And when that comes on, it will enable us to further reduce reliance on mm -hmm. well number six and the PFAS levels will go even lower than what I've been showing you. Uh, the other two elements of the strategy are to continue to work with DES on identifying pollution sources. So we know that uh, the car wash was determined to be a pollution source and DES, we did monitoring and 
DES uh, has now pulled their permit to discharge to the ground, so PFAS is no longer entering uh, the Mill Road Aquifer. Uh, but there are other sources, so we're going to uh, continue to work with them to uh, see if there are other sources that can be identified and then abated. Uh, and then also, as we've been telling you, we're going to continue to investigate PFAS treatment removal options. Yeah. And Dan Lawrence, our Director of Engineering, is going to talk to you about uh, those last two bullets. Mm. Any questions on my piece? No, it's Yes. Are you, Carl, do you, do you watch the selectmen's meetings? Because last Monday we had the state representatives in here. And they were talking about Coakley and the cancer clusters and all that stuff. And uh, there were some very nice words, I think I could say, for Aquarian, for what you have been doing as a local company, testing, doing the testing that John has been doing and reporting to us. And apparently that's rather unique. Now uh, communities that have their own water set up are, are starting to do this across the state. But it looks like you've been a bit of a pioneer in this water quality. You may want to try to, on Channel 22, catch the Selectman's meeting from last week, because there was quite an extensive discussion on the contamination. They also mentioned, um, they're also concerned about surface water uh, runoff, uh, Berry Brook and potentially the Little River. Uh, coming down into the area or two from Coakley and from these other contaminants. And interestingly enough, they, uh, I guess the state is now starting to crack down on air quality. Representative Emmerich was telling us that. There are uh, businesses that spew all sorts of pollutants into the air, and you know what happens to it, it drops to the ground. So it looks like you've been a bit of a pioneer as a private company doing this uh, doing this work and, and having our, the reports come to us as, as you do, John. Uh, that's kind of reassuring, I would say. And uh, I think you might be rather pleased if you watch that uh, rerun and, and see the comments that were made. Yeah, thanks, I'll look at that. Yeah, that, that's evidence of our commitment to the quality of our product, to water quality. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always challenging uh, to uh, talk to the public about water quality parameters that don't have enforceable standards set on them. Mm -hmm. So we have enforceable standards for approximately 100 compounds, and it's easy to, to communicate about that. But when mm -hmm. we have non-regulated compounds where the health agencies have not set the safe limit yet, that's always challenging. So mm -hmm. we've learned that what's important to do there is communicate. Yeah. And so do the monitoring, get the test result, share it with the community, yeah. uh, you know, the town leaders and the public, yeah. and let's all figure out together what to do about yeah. this. Because it makes me feel better every time I get your report. It makes me feel like you're on top of everything and, and, uh, and watching out for what's happening. Uh, and I have one other quick question on uh, hydrants later on. Or, okay. Okay. Or if you want me to do it now. Well, uh, I mean... We got a couple more slides. Yeah. Yeah. Ready much? Thank you. Good evening. So um, we've been working with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services in uh, coordinating sampling with local residents, uh, and they did request we uh, allow them to do some surface water sampling, which with the money that we put forward for that sampling. So when you look at this. Um, map that's up on there it's showing uh, different locations of sampling and different concentrations of sampling mm -hmm. and uh, for some reason carl that map doesn't show it there are two um we were discussing this morning can you probably even slide that up what do you want to point out right below you can't see it um there's two red and i'm going to stand up just so you guys can see this <laughs> you can't see on the map i sent it to, to mark um, like here. We are here. Yeah, there's, <laughs> but there's one like here and here in the middle of nowhere that are red. Those are the ones that kind of. <clears throat> there's a few more. There's one. Yeah, just one sort of in here. the middle of nowhere. Um, Some of them we know what the source is. Some of them are just who knows. So when you say red, 
what do you say? There's like that concentration and I can't even read. That the the <laughs> dots aren't quite big enough. The, the green ones basically show low or no levels of PFAS, then it goes up to yellow where it's a little higher, and orange, and then the red and, and purple, which these dots just aren't big enough on this particular yeah. representation, are mm -hmm. real high levels. So you see, you can see them at Coakley, you can see them at the car wash, well, and a few other places. Yes, so. And so we're starting to see them um, at some private <laughs> residences, and that's what you know, and their neighbors didn't get tested, so you have that potential of, mm. you know, and as I said this morning, it seems a little bit intermittent, uh, hard to understand, which makes it kind of worrisome in general for the population, not necessarily for our customers, but people in general. So keep an eye on that. So we're continuing doing that. For the most part, That's this is over. Uh, if DES called me and said two more people were available, we would definitely agree to that. Um, but for the most part, that money has been used and utilized. So. Uh, we have learned a lot. One of the things, and DES has said this, I don't know, you know, and Carl and I were discussing that right now there's no direct connection shown between Coakley and our wells, which is a good thing. That's a positive. Yeah, exactly. Cross your fingers, do whatever you have to. Um, we don't want any of those connections. So we're happy because you can see, you do see um, green in between, and that's always a good thing. So, Carl, you can go ahead. So, um, just to bring you up to speed on treatment um, for PFAS and in terms of where we are. Just, and it's just a little bit of a recount of uh, in 2017, right after we um, had the, uh, in well six, the concentrations of, P, of uh, PFO and PFOS come up. We did do an alternative analysis in uh, 2018. In the first part of the year, we did a uh, bench scale test. Um, and now we're in the midst of pilot scale testing, which is what you can see. Wow. Um, those are large columns. So we're taking water from a monitoring well adjacent to well six. We don't want to actually mess up the well six. Yeah. Um, and what we're doing is we're testing, what the, for the most part, contact time. How long does the water need to be exposed to the media to remove the contaminant, mm -hmm. right? So you have two and a half minutes, <coughs> five minutes, seven minutes, and 10 minutes. And we have two different types of media. The granular activated carbon is the black on the left, obviously. If you're, uh, and um, Carl's gonna point. And then uh, you have, um, really an ion exchange process on the right. Um, and so it's interesting, we, we went back and looked at some assumptions made in 2017 versus what we've able to learn mm -hmm. and what uh, various vendors told us might work. And it's, uh, we're, we're learning a lot through this process. Uh, we were seeing, and like I said this morning, we're not seeing breakthrough. Um, we're seeing a little bit of breakthrough at two and a half minutes um, really quickly as we kind of expected, but the 10 minute point, which is where we expect to end up, we haven't seen any breakthrough, which means we haven't seen any concentrations of any, any PFAS compounds go through the media and come out on the other side. So that's, that's a positive. So that this, uh, this started um, in August and will go through probably January. We want to make sure we exhaust the media and we can understand that. So. So I thought you'd like to see a picture of what's actually there. It's, it's oh, inside. That a, stuff looks scary. Yeah, it's inside. A, it's actually a very good picture of it. It's hard. It's inside a, a container right next to well six, so it's contained. It'll it, it can be heated. Um, so don't uh, forget the monitoring ones. Yeah, I just want to make sure you didn't have any tests, any <laughs> questions on the treatment evaluation. Yeah. So yeah, and we're also in the process of installing um, and actually identifying right now mostly some monitoring wells between. Um, the primary source, which would be the car wash and our well, and well six. Really what they call them sentry wells, you know, use the expression halfway between. We'd like to know halfway between before it gets to yeah. us and understand that. So we're in the process of doing that. We're hoping to finish both uh, that in 2018 and get a set of samples wow. um, to see where we are. Um, so our consultant, Ray Talkington from Geosphere has been uh, actively doing that right now. So we've authorized to do that. Um, and I think that's going to be an important step to understand how things are moving. Uh, as you know, the discharge to the car wash is no longer. So we would love to understand what that means. Is it moving? It, if it's not moving toward us, that's good. But that means it's moving to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of want to understand that as well, because that would be moving away from public water and more towards private residences. So that's, you know, something to think about. Any questions on this? So, um, that map, that's a, that, is that on the DES website? That yeah, that's a map that we, well, you could get all that data on the website. That's okay, all their the data. The most recent version of what you found, like, I know you can't really see those dots. Yeah, we apologize. <laughs> we can have no, that's fine, on but our website. There's an older version. Uh, oh, okay. So we'll just do an update and make it clear, and then you can. But if you were to go to DES's website, you could pull up the map and seeing it all. Okay. Because we get, we get the data from them. We never handled any data. Okay. 
intentionally. We just paid bills. Well, it was it was twenty thousand dollars, and for this amount of information, it's, we couldn't have done that for that, you know. Okay, great. And yeah, I just want to mirror what Mary Louise said. I mean, what you guys have done really, I think, proves and it complements what I learned when I went to that conference in Vermont that this is happening everywhere, and there's mm -hmm. probably a lot of sources around us that are contributing to it, but. Yeah. It needs to still, I think, continue to be looked at statewide as well as probably regionally and nationally, if not globally. So I really want to appreciate what you've done, and if you guys can uh, reduce the rate in January, that will really that will that will really uh, <laughs> be yeah, nice for the rate payers. Ditto what Virginia and, and Mary Louise said. That you guys have been really transparent. You've been willing to come and talk, and that that's been really good. And you're willing to do the testing. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's uh, I think that speaks highly, and I think people can be can be sure that they're getting a safe product and they're getting a product that's tested constantly. Mm -hmm. So thank you. You were, you were talking about those two red dots down in that lower left corner, and Kyle knows exactly what I want to mention to him now. <laughs> is that's all in a place that you guys don't service? Right. What is the intention of eventually service in that area? Do you want me to address it? Or you want to address yeah, it? go. For so um, we don't, we cannot extend water main um, ourselves um, as a regula regulated utility. It would be considered cross subsidization. I'd be providing a main, um, much like I know happened up in Greenland. I know uh, the Coca Landfill Group funded an area, uh, an extension. Um, we get most of the expansion in our system through developers. Usually it's, you know, putting the housing development in, but we can definitely work together. I mean, you'd have to do some level of bond or betterments with a portion of the community. You might be able to get grants. I'm assuming more grants will be available. And I actually think we applied for a grant for the treatment. We didn't receive it, um, but I think the grants would be probably easier to get if you were to say, hey, I have 20, 30, 40 customers, residents, excuse me, residents that have contaminated water. We need to extend that water. I think there'll be grants for that out there. So that's the way I, I mean, that's what I used to do for a living when I was in consulting is chase grants. So that's what I would be doing. Yeah. Okay. And I just want to do, if anyone doesn't have any more questions, I would like to do a little PR for our operations manager for a minute if I could, because I received what? a press release today. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, and you know what, I said this after I got back from the conference that uh, operations manager had received a reward from one of the former presidents of New England Waterworks Association. So that award um, for his paper published in the New England Water Works, New England Water Works Association Journal about the history of the public water system, I apologize, I'm reading this on my phone, that serves Hampton, Northampton, and Rye in Aquarian's program for replacing older water mains. I am honored to be recognized by <coughs> WWA, said McMoran. My thanks to NEWWA Journal for the opportunity to contribute to the advancement of public water supply industry by publishing my paper and hope it helps my colleagues at other water utilities continue to provide our communities with safe, reliable, and affordable drinking water. The award is presented annually to the member of the association who authored the most mer meritorious paper published in the Journal of New England Water Works Association during the previous year. The Dexter Brackett Award was published in 1916 in honor of an early prominent member of New England Water Works Association. So that's quite an achievement, Carl. So well, Congratulations. I should be sure. lucky to have you. Mary Louise, did you have a question on hydrants? Yes, I just have one. Uh, I, I want to thank you, uh, Carl, and, and gentlemen, for uh, doing the color coding on the caps on the hydrants. Uh, just, I think it's reassuring and certainly helpful for our fire department so they know what they're tapping into. And uh, the fire department, I believe, has had uh, uh, an appropriation in its budget for those lollipops, but it seems to me, you know, the, that you put on top the little round thing, so that the hydrant can be identified in case of snow and we're coming up in the winter season. Uh, are you amenable to uh, having uh, your company put those lollipops on all the hydrants? So they no, we've been doing that. Here, those, you those are there because we put them there. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm not. I, they're not all on though. Well, 
I mean, we just held on by the cap. If somebody wants to swipe one for a souvenir, you know, that's what happened. We've got yeah. extras. We'll, re we'll replace them. We're going to go through our yeah. round of winter maintenance here in the next couple of months, so we'll make sure yeah. they're all on there. Because in the winter, uh, if our neighbors can chip in and if they notice, you know, where the hydrant is and all that stuff, it's a little better for everybody because some areas, the neighborhoods will show a lot of the hydrants which is a benefit to everybody. Yep. So, but uh, thank you. I know I was growly at you for the... Uh, some hydrants need those, but there are some that don't, too. Yeah. So there are some that are in the areas that never get covered. And then there are some right. that constantly yeah. get buried. But the color coding, I think, is reassuring. So I thank you for that. Thank you. And by the way, and I guess you are the only private company in New Hampshire who is doing what you're doing with the PFA, OA, whatever they are, and all the testing and so forth. And there are a lot of municipalities who are now going to have to be stepping up to the plate, checking on their water quality. So it's not just something for Hampton. This is yeah. statewide. I just want to share one thing. One thing we've learned is how critical it is to test your own water. People that are trying to extrapolate from one to the other, one of the, the vendors that is working with us, we're looking at the ion exchange, and there's something uh, close, some additional chloride in, in our water that's not in another water they tested. So it actually is changing the results. So you know, if you're talking to people, you, you really have to do it on the water in which you're going to have to treat yeah. because of the water chemistry. So I do try to watch that meeting, All right. Carl, truly, because I think really. it's very informative and very complimentary to you guys. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you very much. We did thank have two you. more slides as well. Oh, okay. Oh, 22, you know, it's our big well. We're crunching through the pumping test data. We expect to have our application for permit by the end of November, mm -hmm. which will give us simply a permit by the first quarter. So ideally it'll be operational for next mm -hmm. summer. And that's just the main we replaced this summer out on Mill Road. But, but that is downwind of it, because the well is behind me. But uh, if there is a problem with the groundwater, coming from Barry Brook and the Little River, if, if, that, if we end up by having stuff start coming down, it could potentially affect well 7 and well 22. That's sort of the last one in line. To, there's other wells. It's, uh, it's going to be hit before that. The, the hydrology really doesn't. You don't think it? We, we've never thought we were getting any water out of Coca, mm -hmm. to be honest. All right. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I think we have some people in the audience waiting about the rail trail. Is it possible that we can move that up? Sure. Yeah. We can move that up. What are we moving? The rail trail. We're going to move that up while we have some people in the oh, audience. Oh, okay. Okay. Do you want to do the manager's report first and then them? Yeah, yeah why don't we, we do, do, the, that, why don't do the manager's report All right. and then we'll start that yeah. first on the old business. Okay. That doesn't take very okay. long. Yeah. Well. Well, depending on what he's got. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, I think we all know the State Department of Public Works uh, Transportation is uh, continuing their work on repairs on the Tide Mill Road Bridge and Route 101. They now have traffic lights up, so if you have uh, uh, critical time periods where you need to be somewhere, uh, those lights uh, will delay you for three or four minutes going up uh, 101 or down 101. Mm -hmm. uh, we suggest you find alternate routes. Uh, the state is also continuing operations to pave Route 101 in Hampton. And you can expect some, some delays as they do that uh, in various areas of the roadway. Anne's Lane construction is continuing. Uh, we will be finished by the end of the month, I'm told, by Public Works. They'll be putting a base course of pavement down on the roadway, and the finished course of pavement will be installed in the spring. Uh, for those of you who are contemplating something you want to change in the zoning ordinance, <coughs> excuse me, uh, petitions can be filed in the selectman's office between November 12th and December 12th of this year. Petition warrant articles can be filed at any time with the selectman's office up until January 8th, 2019. The State Department of uh, Natural and Cultural Resources Division of Parks and Recreation will host a community meeting on Wednesday, November 7th, 2018, from 5 to 6.30. That will be at the Seashell uh, at the State Parks Complex in Hampton. 
uh, please go listen to what's going on. <coughs> uh, they're going to give a report on what's happening with the beach and what their plans and preparations are for the winter, which I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. We uh, we were very fortunate today to have uh, Senator Hassan visit, yeah. visit us at 9:30 this morning <laughs> and present us with a check for almost $84,000 uh, for the fire department for new radio systems. Yep. Um, she has been along with, uh, in this particular one, she's been very instrumental in getting this uh, this appropriation done. She and, and uh, both of us senators, uh, she with our senior senator. Um, have been working very hard on the harbor dredging and uh, we've been in constant touch with the Corps of Engineers yep. uh, to try to uh, make sure that things happen correctly. Mm -hmm. Eversource is uh, doing a, uh, a betterment by watching and, and, and looking at their energy systems. Uh, so if you see people on their power lines, please don't be excited. Uh, they're there trying to review what's out there they're looking at the high tension lines in Hampton. That's Interstate 95, Route 101, off ramp on Exeter Road, Route 27, and Timber Swamp Road. So you may see them around. They have proper ID. If for any reason uh, you need to uh, to challenge them or figure out who they are, what they're doing, they do have ID. They'd be very happy to show it to you. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Any question from the manager on his report? I have. Go ahead. Real quick. Uh, Fred, the uh, DOT um, letters dated October 2nd on the sale of state-owned land in Hampton, that little west, northwest pinchy section. Are we going to be talking about that, doing anything about it? I think we might be smart to grab the land up and well, get the state out. You're going to need a warrant article to do it. So and, we're going to talk have, about Well, you're not going to have enough time is part of the problem. They're, they're looking to sell them now. They're on the market. Oh. So they've advertised them. I suppose we could put in our druthers, assuming we get an appropriation for it. Uh, they're landlocked. Yes. Uh, they're out on uh, Route uh, 101. Right. right up in the uh, They're northwest the result of corner. some of the lots that were cut off as yeah. they built the roadway through there, and they'd like to uh, now sell them. Because I'd like to grab that if we can and see no. what the price is and so forth. Uh, it's well, a bid. It's a bid. Yeah. It's a bid process. Uh, yeah. Right here, right? Yeah. yeah. Because so, I'd hate to have that happen behind our backs and then say, help. Well, the problem is you don't have an appropriation to put the bid in with. Ugh. So uh, we suggested. Does the Conservation Commission have any funding that might? Uh, not not in that amount of money. They're talking over $100,000 for each of those lots. So uh, there's something in that area, um, like depending upon. Basically, if you combine them with several of the lots that are in front of them off of Exeter Road, yeah. uh, you would be able to put a subdivision in there and oh, use those grief. lots as part of the subdivision. Yeah. Not particularly looking yeah. forward to that idea, but yeah. it's possible to do. Um, I would think conservation might have some money, but I don't think they have enough money to purchase either one of those lots. Yeah. I'd like so. to see that as conservation land. Forget the development and stuff. Well, Without the state turning it over to us at no cost, I don't think that's going to happen. So oh. they're looking for the dollars. Yeah. They want to disinvest their money. Uh, their okay. It's, it's, uh, Any other questions for the manager? Yeah. I, just, I just had a question about a letter you sent out to the commissioner of DOT mm -hmm. about the mosh pipe. Is that, do you think that's something that will be without any problems getting? You wanted a Can't guarantee that. We sent a copy of the letter to the governor. Uh, we made application. Uh, in accordance with our contract that we'd worked out with the state uh, to install the marsh pipes along Route 101. And we were told that from November 15th to April 15th, the town would not be allowed to do any work whatsoever on that area of installing new pipes. Uh. Because there's a DOT regulation against it and they weren't willing to give the waiver for, in the regulation for us to do it. Right. Uh, so that changes, if, if that were to hold, that would change our ability to put that pipe in and have it serviceable by the 1st of May. It uh, would then become the end of September, the beginning of October. Uh, and all the work would have to be done during the summer season with high traffic, which means there'll be long traffic delays out on that roadway. Can we appeal? Can we, 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 we have, the, the letter is to the commissioner oh. uh, in order to uh, appeal a decision by the division uh, and we also copied the governor because he has an interest in this. 
particular program. Uh, what we're finding is that, and I think I talked to uh, Aquarian uh, this morning, they're expect expecting the same problem because they're changing their water line, which runs across the marsh oh, uh, okay. uh, to the side of Route 101. Yeah. Yeah. And they're expecting the same uh, answer from uh, DOT that uh, there'll be no construction during a certain time of the year. Oh, great. So, well, so they're okay. trying to follow our lead and uh, trying to get this their work done as well, so, huh. which is very difficult to do. Jim? You're all set. Rick? And, well, I have old business also, but uh, this right. is the town manager's report, I thought. Correct. Okay, we're all set there. So on the old business, we're going to number f move number four to number one to start with. Okay. Just so that we can allow these nice folks to get home early. <laughs> what's, what's early? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the board asked me to uh, review uh, the proposal, uh, draft proposal sent by the Department of Transportation through our Regional Planning Commission with regards to the rail trail. I've done that. Um, you know, let me preface my remarks by saying that the, the town, at least the administration, is not opposed to having the rail trail built. What we are opposed to is spending anywhere from five to ten million dollars to do it. Right. Um, if you take a look at the long range capital expenditures program from the, the city of Portsmouth, which fortunately gets a lot of revenue. Uh, from the state and federal government because of different clauses in the uh, statutes. Uh, we have approximately the same distance of uh, mileage on the rail trail from the Northampton town line almost to the marsh. Mm -hmm. And to build that uh, and pave it, which would be our recommendation, uh, it's about four and a half to five million dollars at today's rates. Good grief. Uh, the portion that runs across the marsh uh, is something completely different and uh, would need sizable amount of work and it would meet, need, need to raise the rail bed itself. Uh, there are, the, 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 the state has changed their proposal from their last submission where the town would pay for it <laughs> to where the state will pay for it. Yeah, all right. But if you look very cl cl closely at what they have done at the bottom of that provision, it says subject to appropriation for all intents and purposes. So mm -hmm. if you sign the uh, agreement, what happens is that the state appropriates two million and the cost is four million, the town is obligated to spend the other two million dollars to finish it. That's a violation of statute to begin with because there's no appropriation for us to pay it with. Um, that needs to change. Uh, I currently have $50 million worth of improvements to make to the wastewater, wastewater treatment plant, which you are aware of, yep. with probably another $50 million coming uh, 10 or 15 years from now on top of that. We don't have enough money to fix our roads. Uh, we're doing them one street at a time, and we probably have another $50 million worth of uh, um, work to do with regards to replacing all the sewers in the town. So we have a, a, a sizable amount of money to spend in the future as, as a community. Um, outside of the rail trail. The other problem I had with the proposal is that this proposal as presented, and, and it was the same as the other proposals, would allow the um, person in charge of the rail division of the Department of Transportation or the commissioner of the Department of Transportation within 180 days notice simply to cancel the use of the trail and put it, put it to other purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, now, they, they, we complained about that before and we said the town's going to invest a lot of money in this and we would even if we don't build it, we still have to maintain it. Um, they said they would pay us back a pro rata share by depreciated value uh, if that were to happen. I have no idea what that depreciated value looks like. I have no idea how they're gonna calculate that. Uh, they haven't said and they've been hesitant to in fact approach that situation. There doesn't appear to be, although they've made terrific, terrific gains in what they're trying to do here, simply by offering to pay for um, the program out of the uh, out of state funds as they become available from the congestion mitigation air quality program. And it looks like from the 10-year program as well, uh, because they don't have enough money in the mitigation program to pay for all of it. 
that's wonderful. I think they've made great strides in that area. Uh, however, um, I can't in all good conscience recommend that the selectmen sign this, this agreement, even if amended. First, it's divided into two sections. There's a section one and a section two. Section one begins at Foss Manufacturing and runs to the Hampton, Northampton town line. Section two begins the same place and runs to the Hampton Falls town line, which means it runs across the marsh. That's a very expensive <coughs> area to deal with. Uh, there are currently two bridges down there. One of the plans that was shown to me indicated that there was at least two, maybe three bridges that would have to be built. Depending upon the style of that bridge and whether it has an HS20 highway loading, you could be talking $20 million a bridge, just depending on how it's built. Or you could be talking a very small amount of money for a bridge that has to be built out there, but you still have to secure it. Uh, so maybe it's only $5 million a bridge. Those are questions I think that need to be answered. Uh, there are some individual items within the uh, proposed agreement that need to be worked on, a mutual agreement sort of situation. Of course, the biggest thing is Pan Am has to be willing to sell the property to the state before anything can get done. There are a lot of programs out there for this type of situation. As I, I, I will remind the board again, this is a state program. Huh. It is not a town program. The state is going to own the property. Yeah. They can do anything they decide they want to do with it. Right. And the program provides for that. I understand that. That's their property. We need to um, work with them to try to straighten out some of the items that are contained in there. Because I can't in good conscience put that saddle in the back of the taxpayers in this town. Right. It's just not acceptable in my opinion. We can, we can get this done, but we're going to have to work together on it. My suggestion is that you work with them on phase one, which is the portion from Foss to Northampton. That should be the first phase done. That's the easiest phase to do. And that would complete about half the rail trail within Hampton itself. One of the concerns that the towns have had are these expenses. Also how the, the contract can be terminated with no ability to dispute it. Mm -hmm. uh, what, that's one of the reasons that we, we suggested that uh, this go before governor and council as a contract between the state and the city and town, whatever is involved. It also appears to us from examination that it requires the town meeting to vote appropriation because otherwise you have no funds to do this with. Uh. And, and this is a sort of a blank check situation because we don't know what the cost is going to be yeah. without a dedicated engineering study. That has not been done at this point. It needs to be accomplished. It's going to take some time to do that. I think we need to work with the state on it, as we have indicated we're willing to do in the past. Um, and they've made a lot of changes, which I think are very good, uh, but not enough. I just I have to recommend to you as the manager, as you're the person in charge of your finances, uh, if, as far as expenditure is concerned, is that you don't have the money to do this unless you raise taxes substantially. So we need to continue to work. This is not done yet. This is the beginning. Good. Give you a good give you a good example. There's a piece of property at the Hampton Northampton town line which would make a wonderful staging area. Parking area for the rail trail. Uh, it's right next to our sewer line. There could be uh, laboratories put in there. Could be rest areas put in there. It's currently a state DOT piece of property. And when I inquired about that, the state said, if you want to pay full market value for that, you can use it as rent, rented property, but we won't sell it to you. So, and this is on their trail. That's, I think, the kind of cooperation we're getting in certain areas and other areas they're willing to give. What's happening in Hampton, Northampton, and Rye? You know, I can't tell you because what they've done is they have <laughs> written a separate contract now for each town, and we're not supposed to see it. And I haven't seen it. <laughs> the last time we met on this, which was in Northampton, all the towns were there, including the city of Portsmouth. And every single the city and every single town voted not to
to endorse the contract or the agreement with the state mm -hmm. because of the expense involved with the communities. Yeah. So they have now separated it into a number of different agreements. Yeah. And um, I asked and I got no response back from the Department of Transportation. Uh, in a friendly telephone call, uh, I, I have not seen the other agreements. I'm not sure I'm going to. Um, for the town manager, I have a question. Had, they have not seen these last this last round, right, that you just went through for us? This had to come to the board first. I report to the board of selectmen. I don't right. report to anybody else. So you need to instruct me as to what you want me to do. I think that the real tool committee probably wants sort of the same thing that you want. I think they just want the board to be, you know, not against the project for the project happening eventually one day if it's done properly. And I, I have a real problem with how before it was one agreement for all the towns and now they have separate agreements. It seems like that would just make it more difficult for everyone. I think if what you're suggesting could happen actually happens, we all everyone work to can get together. together and figure out, you know, what are Hampton's concerns, what is, right. you know, all the towns involved. We had agreed to all work together on this. Right. And so we're being divided up at this point. Um, I can't tell you why. Well, I wish you wouldn't. Okay. You know, <laughs> I, have to, I have to complain vigorously about this. The Regional Planning Commission has uh, just accepted uh, the fact that they seem to control what happens in the cities and towns. Mm. I'm allowed to talk to my board on this. If you want to make an appointment with the board, you can do that. But I don't think you should come charging into a meeting. I think it was very disingenuous of the Regional Planning Commission, in particular, to, to send this out. <coughs> Actually, I didn't even receive it. And I received a, a request for a meeting to discuss it. And I hadn't even received it or read it. Mm. I, think, I think this is a big push by DOT. And you folks get paid by them to do this. That's part of your income. I think we need to work together, and I don't see us working together at this point, and that's one of my problems. I think you're pushing the wrong way, and you're going to end up with a problem in your hands sooner or later that's not going to be good. <coughs> the other towns complained vigorously about this the last time we met. That's why you've got a unanimous vote against the rail trail in the, in the contracts. I don't want that vote. I want this done because it has a good advantages to the community. <coughs> <coughs> but the harder you push, the worse this is going to become. I, I already know several members of the state legislature are completely against this agreement. And they're willing to go to the governor and they're willing to go to the legislature <coughs> to change it if they have to. I just don't think that's the way we should do it. Go ahead, Jim. Did they come in tonight to have us sign this or just to... No, no. <coughs> well, I, I, they I may wish you to sign uh, it. There might have been some miscommunication. But I think it's 100% positive to have a rail trail. I've right. seen it in other towns, I've seen it in other places, and I think it's an extremely <coughs> positive aspect. So I think what we should be doing is trying to work through this. If we have had miscommunication and their problems, I think we should try to do away with that and move on from the forward here and try and get something done that can benefit the town. I, I, I agree 100% that we've had problems with the state in the past, so we're not going to enter into an agreement where the state's totally in control and we have to go to them for permission to do anything. I agree with right. But I do agree that it could be a positive. There's been some problems, obviously. There's some, some feathers been ruffled here, but that's fine. I, I, that can all be worked through. And I, right. I, I really think we should think about supporting the concept and going forward with it. I agree with what you just said exactly. We'd love to, because I think that's important for the community and I think it's important for everybody in the community. We, we just ha are having problems getting the state to agree to that. <clears throat> Mary Louise. I'm not going anywhere with an agreement that binds the town to bleed money over the coming years. Um, the Hampton shall protect and leave undisturbed all underground and overhead utilities on the corridor after rail trail construction, including new utility lines authorized by DOT. Hampton shall be responsible for the clearing of all downed trees across the rail trail 
All cleared trees shall be removed from department property and disposed of off-site, except with written approval from the Bureau. The department, DOT, retains the authority to approve additional utility services of all kinds to cross over, under, and within the corridor. This is this is a money grabbing. Scheme. I think we just said that this it needs to be worked on. Work yeah, it does. Well, we're it looking, needs we're a just lot looking for support. support. We're not looking yeah. to sign it tonight. But I'm not, right. not interrupting you. When I have a, well, that's I'm, all right. I I'm going to I'm going to have my say here. This has the potential of bleeding a huge amount of money over the ta out of the taxpayers over a very large number of years. And then it says finally, basically, at the end, if they decide they want to get rid of it, they being the state, they can just go ahead and, and dump the whole thing after all the money that people are putting into it. Besides which, is that not a drainage area, Fred? coming down off the Exeter Road and stuff, the old rail line. Oh yeah, sure, there's lots yeah. of drainage problems yeah. in there. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, I have no confidence in the state of New Hampshire and their little schemes. Um, and there's one, one thing here that I'm trying to find real quickly. Uh, they, they can take they can just stop it and uh, leave us high in air. The state has the right to revoke this rail trail agreement at any time upon 180, degree, 180 days written notice mm -hmm. to Hampton to cease use of the rail trail. That's state law, 226. Well, well, whatever it is, I think this, we, have, we, we have a challenge with a huge amount of money for the wastewater yeah, treatment done. plant. We have a large bonded and indebtedness not, that we haven't talked about, about tonight. And we're not talking about money right now. We're just talking. And this is a problem for the, this. I'm not going to see the public taxed into extinction. I don't think anyone wants that, but it's the idea of the rail trail. Do we, I mean, I agree it's a great idea. I think anyone that can get people to bike or walk or do anything that's not sitting in the car driving, making traffic worse is a good thing. It's good for families, it's good for children, it's good for the elderly. And I don't think that Ms. the everyone here right now expects us to do anything that is not advised to us of our town manager in regarding to sign an agreement. I think they're just looking for the, you know, general okay the consideredness of the board that it's a good idea. But I mean, I got to tell you DOT, however many towns are involved separating the towns and you know picking and choosing this guy's going to get this agreement uh -huh. this is just typical come in here and sit down and talk to us all together this is what the problem is no one talks sorry Rick. yeah now is it possible that when we under old business the number one thing is november meeting with state officials is this something that we could ask them at that time no no because that's state strictly parks. that's state because parks. that's strictly state Stri parks strictly state parks yeah i mean we could have a meeting with dot but yeah. it would be a different subject but would this rail trail fall under the jurisdiction of the state parks at all no not at all it's under the jurisdiction of the rail division of the department of transportation mm -hmm. i support the concept of supporting them and working through it no money right now or anything but i support the concept of, of, of moving forward to work with the people who want to get something done. As do I. It's going to take some time to do that, but we can do it. Absolutely. So any other? What do we need? To, do we need a motion saying we support it? Or just no, I think you I think if you just have the consensus, you support it. I mean, and, and your administration supports it as well, as long as we can straighten out some of the issues with it. Yeah, it's, you know, I think everyone supports it, but the problem is if there's going to be a, a monetary outlet, outlay it's not going to happen that's Everyone the unfortunate does part support it. I don't unless support it. there is you know, the some grind. federal this funds a, or something this like is a that. consensus and I believe we have a consensus of the board that's here that that we overall support the concept of the idea without it without well, the count town. Me out. again it's a consensus and that only takes three good so. yeah I'm fine with that <coughs> okay very good okay thank, thank you, you. November meeting with the state officials. 
I would encourage you to have town council come up. And he is here. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see him. <coughs> He's quiet. He melts into my, the background. My reason for putting this on on here was to come up with an agenda to see what we want to do. That oh my goodness, Mark, thank at you at that meeting. Thank um, you. Uh oh. Thank you. Oh yes. Yep. Section E. So we have had some discussions over um, why we are having a non-public, and so I asked Mark to come in and talk about that. I also wanted to come up with a agenda for what we had, um, wanted to talk about with um. Parks and Rec. Uh, Natural resources. Natural resources, yes. So go ahead, Mark. Okay, so uh, the ability under the right to know law to <coughs> conduct non public sessions is very specific as to the exceptions that enable you to go into a non public session. Mm -hmm. And one of those is uh, 91 hyphen capital A colon 3 Roman 2 small e consideration or negotiation of pending claims or litigation which has been threatened in writing or filed by or against any public body or any subdivision thereof or by or against any member thereof uh, until the claim or litigation has been fully adjudicated or otherwise settled. And so uh, just as a topic that I believe can be discussed in a non-public session are the claims that were made in the litigation that was commenced February 14th of 2018 and uh, withdrawn without prejudice in August of this year. Those are claims that have not only been uh, in litigation and have been and threatened in writing, but have, were actually filed in court. And I believe the withdrawal of those claims without prejudice was certainly not any indication that we never intended to pursue them. I've given you a copy of the minutes of July 30th, 2018, where Selectman Griffin's motion, seconded by Selectman Woolsey and passed unanimously five to nothing, indicated that I was to file with the court a voluntary non-suit without prejudice right. to enable the town to obtain official records through the right to know law and other requests in order to file an amended complaint against the state as needed within a year. So I would not consider the claims that we've made before to be uh, out of the picture. Uh, to the contrary, they're very much in the picture. And so I believe under the terms of this subpart E, consideration or negotiation of pending claims or litigation, these, the claims that arise in this uh, document, the complaint, can be discussed in a non-public session. And uh, I would suggest to you that if we're talking about uh, the Parks Division of Natural Resources, the claims that could be discussed, if the board wishes, are count two, the parking revenues claim, uh, count Roman three, the unjust enrichment and quantum merit as to the town expenditures for fire, police, and public works, and count four, which is the concessions claim. Now, as to who can be present, uh, this E, small e, does not exclude uh, from there uh, negotiation with uh, state officials. And so I believe that uh, the, nego the consideration or negotiation of pending claims or, or litigation, which has been threatened in writing or filed, uh, these claims that we previously articulated can be discussed. Now, if we decided to go outside those, <coughs> those claims, for instance, to discuss any, any and all things that were in the, uh, the former agreements uh, that Fred would get every year, um, then I think that would be a problem under the right to know law. Mary Louise. Yeah, I, I admit to being confused here. The litigation that was filed has been withdrawn. Without, without prejudice. Without prejudice. It's, and, just, and, it's and still sitting there. It's <laughs> the claims that we have are still as viable 
now as they were before. Yeah, well, I agree with you. But I, in all this discussion about talking about parks and recreation and all that stuff, um, I have not been given a clear idea why we want to have this meeting with them at all. Uh, because there is literally no litigation pending now. That's that's no. claims are pending. Claims are pending. What claims? The claims that we articulated in this suit in that this I've been authorized to refile once uh, we okay. get our uh, okay. our uh, information. But, but you haven't refiled yet. Not yet, but it's been authorized I, as far as I'm okay. concerned. Okay, and that's that's fine, but it. If it's been authorized to be done in the future, we're talking about right now, November 1st, where there is no litigation filed. We, they know what the lit litigation involves because they read it when you filed it, but now it's been withdrawn. Um, I, have, I have not understood until this point in time what exactly we were trying to meet with the state for. That's what and we where it says for. parks and recreation, wait a minute, it says parks and recreation. Now I assume that we're talking about all of the expenses uh, that the town in, uh, incurs because of the operation of the state parks. And that's the stuff at, that you can't Beach. talk about because we have still have that litigation that's out there hanging. And well, if we had withdrawn it, just simply withdrawn it, but we withdrew it without prejudice so that right. we could bring it back. Correct. But that's not saying we're going to bring it back. And if we have this meeting and, and we have, and we have uh, agreements on some things, then there'll be no need to. I Wouldn't just, that be good? Wouldn't I that have, be good? I have a problem. Likely. I have a problem with us sitting down with employees of the state of New Hampshire they're not elected officials, with employees of the state of New Hampshire. I did ask Mark uh, earlier if we could have a secretary. I will attend there, the meeting because I want to know what's going on. But I asked if we could perhaps have a secretary to take verbatim minutes of that meeting. And he indicated, because I think we should have a record of it instead of everybody sitting there out of the public eye blabbing about parks and recreation and money and all sorts of stuff. I have a problem not taking the a town attorney's advice. Well. And who are we meeting with? Do we know yet? I don't know. Well, then, I'm, I'm going to ask you. Yes, we do. Oh. It would be three staff people from the Department of Natural Resources. Okay. Who operate that division. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the commissioner has also indicated he would like to be present if he has availability that particular day. A staff member assigned by the Attorney General to the defense of all cases and all information and uh, material things with, with that department. Mm -hmm. And the Commissioner, who's it's a he Bill or she? Bryce. I, <laughs> I think it's Sarah Stewart. I, I think it's, yeah, it's a, it's a new commissioner, so I, I haven't yeah. had a chance to meet the new commissioner. And when we originally brought this up, they had had a problem with trash. And that's what we wanted to talk to him about. Well, we trash is one of the legitimate operations. Yeah. Right? yeah. Correct operations, yeah. and that was what we were talking about. And all this other stuff has come up. Right, and now we're saying it. we're restricted to this other stuff. But what yeah. other stuff? I th I th the things that can be talked about in a non-public session would be those things that have already been articulated as litigation claims. Right. So, so we could talk about parking revenue. Yes. Oh, sure. Right. And we could talk about what else? Trash. The concessions. That's concessions. another count. Yeah. And then we could talk about the expenditures for police, public works, and fire yeah. uh, made necessary by the state's operations. Okay, so those are all on the table. Yes. And trash. Um, That's public well, that works. would be public works. Yeah, could there you go. Trash. And what's your recommendation? Well, I think uh, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult. It has been difficult in past to. Uh, in a public forum for there to be meaningful discussions. We had okay. seen the governor came down and yeah. uh, that generated a lot of press, uh, none of it leading to a constructive resolution. Um, I think it's, right. I think it would, it's mm -hmm. an opportunity that we should take. Okay. Um, I agree with 
Well, I agree with what you're saying, Mark. But I have a question, too, because I was at the precinct last week, and I was asked by Commissioner Rage if he could be part of the meeting as an elected official from the precinct. I'm just asking because I told him I would, so that's what I'm doing. Um, I think, it, I think uh, for these, these discussions to be productive, it's likely that these would, minutes would necessarily have to be taken, but it's likely that those would need to be sealed. Mm -hmm. And the more people you involve who aren't right. uh, okay. parties to <coughs> things, the, the, more, the more you have a problem. Right. Councilor, what's the impediment to having verbatim minutes? Uh, well, minutes aren't hours. That's the problem. Uh, if you get someone in there trying to take down things no, verbatim, I, that you, you, you have the, a risk that uh, you aren't going to have a, a discussion that's, uh, that's uh, as productive as you might otherwise have. Well, I, I was thinking of Laurie in planning, and she is an excellent note. Uh, no taker minutes taker. I agree. I'm sure she is, but let me just bring up the fact that uh, before they agreed to meet with us, we had to give them a list of people who would be in attendance mm -hmm. for their approval. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is typical. What so. we we're talking on, yeah. on we're the elected officials, and they tell us. What yes. To know. Yeah, I think. I <laughs> But the state is is bullying again. What, well, what do we what do we need a motion? Do we need a consensus again? Yeah, we need a motion say. to, I would say, yeah, for the topics. For the I topics. would make a motion to accept and the I'll topics second. that the that the, the councilor has has given to us. And uh, it will be limited in scope to those topics. Yeah. because we don't want to mess up the right, right to know law. Correct. Right. And then if we can come out of this with something positive, maybe we can have an additional meeting. To talk about some of the other stuff. That'd be terrific. It would be. All right, so we get a, we have a motion, motion and a second. second. <coughs> Hope spring is All those in favor? Well, I'll cross my fingers. Something better than I'm not happy. Well, we got we gotta do a leap at some point. So will you come up with that list before the first fourth and you that you've just given us? Sure. That we will make sure that that's the list that we go by. And uh, do we do we want to have somebody taking minutes? Oh, you would you would need to have minutes. Go right. have so, a public session. So then can we ask Lori if she would take the minutes for that yeah. meeting? She's incredible at taking place. Well, I thought Fred right. just said that he had to already submit who's going to be there. Right. Oh, well, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think what? Mark can take the minutes. Mm, that's not the same as having a secretary taking the minutes. Well, okay. we're, we're being Did asked you hear for his us. answer, Mary Louise? Yeah. Okay, then what's what's the discussion about? And she works, she works for the town, and she. He already understand. told you that this has already been decided. What do you? I don't care who takes the minutes. Somebody's got to take minutes. Right. And Mark's absolutely positively correct because this is a lawful meeting, so therefore you've got to have minutes. The question is whether or not you do them verbatim. <clears throat> I, I think we, we have Lori here to take the minutes as our recording secretary. Okay. And, just and we'll add her to the list. Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah. And she will be cautioned, obviously. And yep. she's said, Oh, well, she'll know it. She's, she knows. she's very good. She knows the rope. She's excellent. All right, so, all right. And we'll share the minutes. With them. Right. Well, since they're not sharing we'll them, we'll, them. we'll share, share them with them. Yeah. yeah. So, I think that's good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Mark. Thank you. Right. <laughs> now exactly. we're all cheered up. Okay. We have the Municipal Budget Committee access to the NHMA. Yes. Mm. I I'm going to make a motion, and if it gets second, I like discussion on it. Actually, there's two motions. Um, I've talked to the chairman about them a little bit, and then subsequent to talking to the chairman, I've had some discussions with um, members both in and out of the budget committee. And I would the first motion I would like to make is to completely rescind the Board of Selectmen policy regarding NHMA access. I'll second. Anyone want to Any discuss? Good, uh, discussion? I think it's a terrible mistake. We've been down this road before. No. And I agree that there was apparently some uh, rocky roads earlier, but you know, we're sitting here preaching about transparency for Portsmouth and transparency, we're transparent, but we're not even giving our own board, never mind other elected officials in town, 
the same access to a resource that the town has. Well, so okay. that that's my argument, and I think that um, the more I talk to people, and I've been on the budget committee thir for three years in a row now, mm -hmm. and they've changed, and we have a new chairman, and there's less people, and the chairman has been working directly. I've talked to the department staff that he's been working with directly, him and both the vice chairman, and they have not had any problems with anything as far as anyone being nasty or demanding information. I think it's gone very, very well this year. And I think we really need to uh, turn a new leaf over because the people are watching this and they do not like it. I'm telling you right now, they don't like it. All right. And uh, I've had, well, oh, go ahead. I can speak go too. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I also had a meeting with the, uh, the chair of the budget committee. Uh, we actually sat down for coffee and had a conversation about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've got an amendment to the motion, and it will say that the chairs and vice chairs of both committees, both the selectmen and the budget committee, may di directly contact the NHMA. This will include, but not limited to, seminars and asking legal and other questions. If anybody from the respective mm -hmm. boards wants the N NHMA to get an opinion on a particular cop topic, they will need to go through the respective chair or vice chair. So that means that any of the members of the budget committee will have to go through their chair or vice chair, or any members of this committee will have to go through Who's the chair. Who's the chairman now? The chair is Tim Jones. Tim Jones. I said, anytime the budget committee chair or vice chair contacts the NHMA for, deal for anything dealing with a legal opinion, they will notify the chair of the board of selectmen of such opinion before informing anyone else. So that allows the chair and the vice chair of both committees to uh, to go to the NHMA. But I, I want to, you know, as I understand, legal opinions of the NHMA are just that, their opinion. Yeah, right. And the town of Hampton has their own attorney yeah. for legal matters who, who, who d takes care of our legal opinions. So, and for the second motion, I would have the well, Board of Selectmen allow the Budget Committee to contact the NHMA to schedule a the free seminar per year that allows the town that is allowed to the town on a topic of their interests. This seminar will be open to all members of all town boards and employees and anyone attending the seminar questions can be asked according to the rules of the seminar as it is the same as with other attendees. I second that motion well, as is. Yes, I was going to say, On let's both tackle of that first. So which one? No, we, I'm uh, the one you just read. I read second. both of them. No, I know, the one you just read, the, the second, second one that you proposed. I will uh, agree with uh, Regina on that and putting that forward. But I have a question on the your, your first All right, so iteration. go to the first motion. Go to the first one. Well, I'll second motion. the first one. All right. No. Okay, so we have a motion and second. And you have a second on okay, the amendment, so, so talk about the amendment. Okay, you're ta we're talking about the First Amendment right. Right. that you put forward. Okay, I have served since 1978 both on the Budget Committee and the Board of Selectmen. And I have never seen a problem with having individuals contact individual members of the select Board of Selectmen or the Budget Committee and the budget committee is considerably reduced by now. Uh, there are very few instances, I don't remember any instance of an abuse uh, of the uh, kindness of calling up the um, NHMA individuals. I've known some of the NHA members since before they went with the NHMA. So I have never been made aware of any kind of abuse. I can't see that the NHMA is going to be overwhelmed with calls either by selectmen or members of the budget committee. Well, I think if you go back, they were, and that's one of the reasons Where? why we came up, we came up with this. Yeah, and I thought you were the one that was causing the problem. Well, I As had, I remember I it. had uh, a little difficulty, uh, which Mark uh, well knows, when I served as the chairman of the budget committee in 2016. And Mark was kind enough at that point in time to allow me to call Attorney Buckley. And when I talked with Attorney Buckley, and uh, we had a very pleasant conversation, and I went back and reported to Mark what happened, and Mark didn't agree with Attorney Buckley. 
So you, you, you and never, so what you, you just said will be it was exactly what make, make but I I just said as the chair or vice chair no. from the budget committee can go directly to the that, that's, NHMA. That's fine, but what I'm talking about here in your motion is with the chair and the vice chair of the board of selectmen. We are five independent elected officials. But we speak and I as resent, one board. No, no. Yes, we do. No, I'm, what I'm, I'm saying I'm losing track of all these motions, so. but I'm voting against them anyway. Each, yeah, each, uh, each member of this board should be allowed to. How many? How many times are you going to do it? The, it's the idea that you are. Let's vote. Inhibiting our right to pick up the phone and talk to the municipal association whose dues have gone I up don't, now over I don't believe anybody's dollars. right was inhibited. Yes. It was only the fact they had to bring go through the chair or the vice and chair. And I don't think that's This reasonable. is how it all happened again, the first time. The motion, the, mo <laughs> the motion for the amendment is, and I will read it again, the chair and vice chairs of both the selectmen and the budget committee may directly contact the NHMA. This will include, but not limited to, discussions of seminars and asking legal and other questions. Mm -hmm. In, anyone from their respective boards who wants the NHMA for an opinion on a polit, pol, particular topic, they will need to go through their respective chair or vice chair. Mm -hmm. Anytime the budget committee or the vice chair contacts the NA, NHMA <coughs> for any dealing with a legal opinion, that they will notify the chair of the board of selectmen of such an opinion before informing in, anyone else. And I have a motion and a second. Uh, on that amendment. Mr. Chairman, if yes. I could just add to that, um, I'd appreciate it if you added me in where you're there also, because if opinions are being given and I'm not made aware of it, um, it's, it becomes difficult to do my job when I'm asked the same question without knowing what somebody else has said. That's why I'm against it. So well, we, can, we can... You guys are thinking MHMA is not just lawyers. I mean, no, there, there's other not. resources yeah. you can use for, which and, I and think... I, it, and I would think that is if, if when they bring it to the chair, obviously, as at least while I am chair, that will that will be brought to you, obviously, and that's what that yeah, was the intent of that. But, but I mean, you're ta what this is talking about is questions. When the NHMA is referred to here, it's to their legal staff. Right. That's and what's being and talked about. As I about. said before, just to clarify it, is legal. That's just a legal opinion, and the town of Hampton has our own attorney. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if they, they would, they would usually, uh, if directed to do so, they'll copy me on the question and on the answer they give. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put words in their mouth, but it's good for me to know what they're saying. <coughs> yeah, that's so, good. I, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think we're talking specifically about questions from boards. Right. As a citizen, any citizen can call New Hampshire Municipal Association. No. Well, they no. can call it, but they're not going to get an opinion. No. Well, not an opinion, but for answers on other issues. Right. They will get on, some. There's, some, there's things that it... Limited in scope what they're yeah. going to get. Yeah, but they're going to present some stuff. But I, I think it's a good compromise. I think if you worked it out with the chairman of the uh, budget committee, I think if he's in agreement... I think it's because there was a problem before, and the problem was there was the whole big problem with 91A, created a lot of problems, created a lot of misunderstandings, and yep. I think every business has a, has a chain of command. <coughs> I, I see no problem with it. I mean, we wouldn't be doing something, you know, without checking with the town manager on certain things, or else you're going behind his back and you're not. So I, th I think as members of boards, so we can go to our, our vice chairman or our chairman. Can That's I say my one thing on this? I'm going to vote for this motion because it's better than what we got now. But I agree with Mary Louise. All us five, we all got voted here the same way. Right. We're all equal. Absolutely. She just got back in. So guess what? How many votes did you get? Those many people want are sitting here. Yeah. So she should have the same rights that we all have sitting here. And it's the same thing for the budget committee. But this is a compromise. So we have equal access. Everything goes through either the vice sure. or the chairman. Yep. And I'm good with that because it's equal access. But I just want everyone to remember that just because things happened in the past doesn't mean that's how we should still be acting now. There's never been abuse in the past contacting the NHMA. So we have a, uh, an amendment. All those in favor? I'm opposed. Three, two opposed. opposed. Two opposed. Okay. So now we're back on the on the motion. So the motion will be 
No, what's the second thing? Well, we'll do the second. That'll be a second motion because she brought it up for us. Oh, okay. So, so the motion will be, as I just read, that the chair and the vice chairs of both selectmen and budget committees will direct, may directly contact the NHMA, but will include but not limited to seminars and asking legal questions, legal and other questions. If anyone from their respective board wants, in the Hampshire, wants the NHMA to get an opinion on a political, particular cop topic, they will need to go through their respective chair or vice chair. <laughs> Anytime the budget committee or chair or vice chair contacts the NHMA for anything dealing with a legal opinion, they shall notify the chair of the board of selectmen before any opinion informing any before such opinion before any uh, before. In for me, in informing <coughs> anyone else. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's right. Whatever. So that is the motion. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Three oppo opposed? opposed. Two opposed. Okay. The second motion is the Board of Selectmen will allow the Budget Committee Chair to contact the NHNA to schedule a free seminar that we get per year that is allowed the Town of Hampton on a topic of their interests. This seminar will be open to all members of town boards, town employees. As, as to anyone attending the NHMA seminar, questions can be asked in accord of the rules of the seminar, this, as the same with any other attendees. So I made that motion. I'll second. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, <laughs> you know, it was, it, I actually had a very good conversation with Tim, and uh, I think I, I hopefully this we now can move forward, and this will work out well for them and well for us. Good so, change in selectmen's recycling ordinance. Change in selectmen's recycling ordinance. We got that last month. Um, Tom Manager, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, you've been discussing things about recycling. For the last several months, mm -hmm. uh, and I hopefully I've been paying attention to what you've been saying, and I took all that information, and what I did is I rewrote your your uh, selectman's recycling ordinance that represents what you've been talking about in general terms. Um, not that I'm asking you to do anything like this. I'm just trying to show you what it would look like if you decided to do something like this, and you've been talking about doing it. Um, and that's my only reason for providing it to you. Uh, it's, it's a radical change from where you are, uh, and I'll let you digest or destroy or have me shred it or do whatever you'd like with it. Uh, the idea was to put in, in writing what you had been talking about over several months to try to show you what it would look like. Yeah, I have a question. For, are we going to get a copy? We already did. We did. You already well, did. Last week. I don't I've got Last so much week. stuff here. Okay, no, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Oh, I'll go digging through then. But my my concern is letting the public know because there are big changes being right. made here. Oh yeah. And and having a list that can be posted on Channel 22 and maybe even stickers put on the recycling carts saying what is allowed. Because now I'm nervous when I'm standing in my kitchen and saying, gee, is this, you know, I think I asked Fred if I can throw the cat food cans in the... In, yes, they're in, the, in the recycling, <laughs> right. So we need to have some clarity. Those ladies were in from the condos last week. Yeah. I think we need to have something clear, and we're probably going to have to adapt it a number of times, given what's happening with China and with the market and all that stuff. So I think we need some kind of clarity. Didn't and Chris say they were working on that? And it was going to be on the website? Yes, that, and it keeps on changing all the time. Yes, but he said he's developing it, and they're yeah. going to put it on it's the website. Working. So I, I would say, why don't we bring after budget season, after we get mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. working yeah. on the budget, yeah. Yeah. why don't we either have a public hearing mm -hmm. or bring it, you know, or first have a meeting on it with yeah. us, right? Mm -hmm. And then maybe have a public hearing afterwards so we can allow people to know what's going on. Yeah, post the information. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think I think we wait for a month or so. Because it's a zoo right now. It, it is a zoo, and it, 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 it's it's terrible. Well, we're so, in the same pickle you're in. So yeah. we'll schedule it for probably, I don't know, early December. Yeah. Okay. After we finish the budget, yep. we'll get on with other things. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Old business. You said you had something on the old business. Yeah. Um, okay. 
I have had um, several people that have called uh, regarding the conservation coordinator and um, you know I don't really know what to tell these people when they call but I have fi about five people that have uh, been have called and uh, or come to talk to me and some of it's been over for the last couple of months um, what you know it's an ad supposedly an advisory position there now when people uh, don't necessarily agree with the information that they get there who do they get to complain to you know what is her chain of command uh, no 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 conservation commission conservation commission okay so who do they you know how do the people know who to get in touch with what do they have to make an appointment I mean, I'm talking about the people that actually don't have to get permission. They're going in there and asking questions, and they're told that they have to do this and they have to do that. Mm -hmm. And the, where the problem comes is people want to be agreeable, and people <coughs> want to do what has to be done. The next thing you know, they've spent thousands of dollars, and then it's a never-ending finish, and that just keeps going on and on and on. And everybody that lives on the ocean the front or on the marsh have these issues mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people aren't happy mm -hmm. and I do realize that you know like I s said to people and I've told them all to come to talk to you um, okay. so that you can <laughs> explain sure. this issue <coughs> all, um, I, all that I could tell them Rick well, is that they've got to go to the chairman of the conservation you need commission to do, then they're going to be coming to you okay um, that's fine. and I'm, I feel better that you tell them yeah. um, because uh, I feel that there's probably lawsuits that are uh, down the road. Um, you know, do, is there a play? W what comes in? Who has uh, the final say? Is it the state or is it the town? And if there is a, you know, uh, I just find that people are, there's one woman has had five, uh, uh, whatever they call them, special permits. And she was told that the town lost the special permits. She had to go all over and have her whole uh, land surveyed again and again. And you know, one permit was fifteen hundred dollars. Another one was one thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. I mean, uh, and I hear these stories all the time. And many times I hear the stories because the people really aren't happy afterwards of what the result mm -hmm. is. Uh, so it's like. I feel that there should be somebody that uh, can these people can call up and talk to. Mm -hmm. um, these people are not people that want these. Sometimes they don't even want special permits, but they're given th these th things. Well, you have to do this. You have to do that. <coughs> and um, I, I think that there should be some way that these people can protest, whether it's in, on a state level or whatever. Uh, you know, because I do, you know, no one really wants to sue everybody <coughs> the worst part about it is is everybody wants a better situation to exist mm -hmm. in the final uh yeah. solution everybody okay. want no one wants anything bad mm -hmm. but what's happening are the people are being that own these properties are going to great expense <coughs> and uh it's really quite a problem mm -hmm. um you know it, to me, it just doesn't make any sense, and I'm going to continue to recommend that the people come and talk to you because I think you have a better way of explaining it than yeah. I do. Well, I will certainly send them to the proper authority. Mm -hmm. Get ready because they're on their way. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, I'm know, ready. The big problem, and this is the way it is with many things here, yeah. is that the people really don't want to complain. They want me to complain for them, and I'm, I just am not going to be doing it. I understand. And, um, you know, but I find that there, I've been told by all of the different department heads that here, uh, before I send them to you, people, different ones that have been here tonight have said to me, would you please call me before you send them to Fred? But I don't know who to tell them to call. They can't just c pick up and call the Conservation Commission. Yes, yes, okay. And a lot of people resent the fact that they, these aren't really not professionals that are on the Conservation Commission to begin with. Now maybe uh, the coordinator is, but 
these some people feel that they are not getting the best uh, uh, advice. They feel like their money's going down the, a hole, a black hole. Well, we'll see if we can't put some lights on on the hole. So <laughs> I think that there needs to be a phone yeah. number that people can call yeah. up and yeah. talk to. We will see that that's available. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have anything on the old business? The only thing I have on the old business is the, uh, the municipal budget review for us. We did tonight, we did police, animal, co animal control, emergency medical, emergency management, management parking, yeah. and fire department. Yeah. Right. We were going to try Thursday night, but the, the yeah. zoning board zoning board's meeting Thursday meeting night. is Thursday night. So we will do <clears throat> what we were going to do on Thursday night on next Monday night. Right. And then oh, okay. so what we were going to do next Monday night, we will do the following Monday night. Okay. Because I've, we, we've talked with, uh, there's meetings going on, and I've talked with Channel 22, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that we're able to mm -hmm. video it so that people can see it, and mm -hmm. they, they don't have any time. We so we'll have, the 20, we'll have the 29th, we will have, so that will be the Department of Public Works, Hydrants, Lighting, and Conservation. Then we will have the 30th if we need to have anything final. If we don't okay. finish it, we will have the 30th to do it. Because the Budget Committee deserves time the to The Budget review. Committee is getting it in plenty November of time. November 6th is... That's, when, yeah. that's what they have as a schedule, but they are amenable to changing. As he had said to me, but, you still, he's, but you're we're still getting it to them in yeah. plenty of time. Yeah. So. Because the longer it goes, the harder it is to squash all the information. So that's in. what that's oh, yeah. the schedule we will have. <clears throat> yeah. Now we have new business. We have a garage for Channel 22 van. Mr. Chairman, yeah. um, should have thought of this a long time ago. Um, I was out there the other day, and I, I noticed that the uh, Channel 22 van was maintained by the Public Works Department. They had to put a sticker on it because it's that time of the year for municipal vehicles. They brought it back and parked it way out and back. Mm -hmm. The prior van we had was, was broken into uh, at least once out back there, so I <coughs> made sure that tried to make sure that it was parked up in the front of the parking lot where it could be seen by the police from the street. Mm -hmm. Anybody fooling around with it would be noticed. However, um, it would be better. We'd be better off if that van was locked up someplace, and so we don't have any place to secure it. My suggestion is that we get a proposal to build a garage out and back we put it out to bid and we yep. build a garage and we lock that van up in it it's got yep. there are times when there's over a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment in that van when they're out doing things fortunately the van is much better secured now than it used to be it is and and we it's don't have still. much in the way of it in it out, out in the yard the way it sits, way it sits. Uh, because we bring all the material back in here but that that means a lot of extra labor trying to load things in yeah. and out all the Absolutely. time if we're locked up in a garage <coughs> It would be maintained better because we wouldn't be out in the elements all the time, yeah. and Correct. it would be much more secure. Okay, so what do you need from us? Uh, authority to go ahead and try to get a proposal to uh, mm -hmm. uh, prepare a bid to yeah. uh, to build a garage out there for that one. Also minute. move, Mr. Chairman. Second. Move, second. All those in favor. So, well, so it's still going to come back to us. Well, how much? Still going to come back to us. What yes, it, cost it does. Is so it's just to get a proposal. Right. That's correct. Okay. Excellent. Okay, unanimous. Yeah. Second thing we had was amendment to the. Chapter 628, Hawkers, Peddlers, and Peddlers, and <laughs> that thing. Inter itinerant vendors. vendors. Itinerant <laughs> vendors, okay. Itinerant. AKA the, my memorandum on mobile food service. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, this, this would allow that to happen on town property. So if you had an activity on town property, whether it's by the town or by someone using town property, you could allowed to have, be allowed under certain conditions to have mobile food service there. So if we did a like a food truck fair or something, I know yeah. like uh, Summersworth has a food yeah. truck fair downtown. Right. Yeah, and it's a great. Would this would this also cover the uh, soup kitchen people? The questions they've been asking. Mm. Potentially, it could. It just depends on how they do it. Yeah, but it would give them more of an option because they've found a trailer or something, haven't they? That's what oh, I've heard. Fine. That's I haven't what I've heard, and they and they. We're told they needed a foundation. Yeah, yeah, because it's, the current zoning ordinance says you can't do this unless you have uh, the facility built on a permanent foundation. Uh, yeah. So, if you pass an ordinance, you regulate town property. Yeah. If you pass an ordinance to do this for activities on town property, for instance, at the the ball field, 
Yeah, mm-hmm. Tuck Field, mm-hmm. okay, when they're having sports activities. Yeah. You could allow it to, be, to happen there under, yeah. under strict control. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it wouldn't thing. be on private property anywhere in town. It wouldn't be on the street anywhere in town. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we would have, con- we, we could turn down the request. It's up to the board. Up it to has board. to be granted by the board. Yeah. Right. We don't want to. We don't want to get this so open that anybody can yeah. rush in and just do something without you knowing about it. Yeah. There are a lot of state okay. licenses and, and. Now, would this uh, cause any problems for the building for, for uh, building inspector for Kevin? I we mean, haven't gone that far yet. Okay. We want to know whether you think this is a wise okay, so idea. Okay, yeah. so we think. Well, I, I think we could, should look into the amendment. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. you're looking for yeah, the consensus wait, of that. because there are instances where a lot of people have weddings now and yeah. they want to have right. uh, Lexi's yeah. food truck come. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and a lot of them have it on town property. Mm-hmm. We have quite a few of those every year. So why don't we look into I'll working move. up a, uh, a an amendment to the... Uh, we, we've got the amendment. I just want to know if you're in favor of doing something like that so that we can yes. talk yes. to the building Consensus department the and the other departments that are involved. I would Consensus say yes. To the board, yes. yes, yes. Okay. Yes. And we'll so. start asking well, questions. Yeah, and you have to... I mean, the, re- the whole reason why there's no food trucks is there's not supposed to be any at the beach. Right. That's what yeah. it's all we about. We don't regulate that right. because it's yeah, state but, property. Yeah, good. But you're talking about... The, uh, you just mentioned about where we have people having weddings. That's at the beach. Well, on our property at the beach. Yeah, so North Beach. Could be we North can't Beach. we can't regulate anything on state property. Right. right. We could do it at North Beach if they would if yeah. they want right. to do it. That's yeah. good. Hey, it might be a new revenue for us to yeah. it's it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wedding venues. And what about private homes though? No. Well, I'm telling you that that p- there's p- people I having know. weddings on pri- in private property all over yeah. the place that are having right. these food trucks. Yes, yeah. I understand. Whatever. I understand, okay. but they're not legal in this town yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Okay, I mean, this is sort good. of a step can in the we, right direction, I think, to that? solve that. Can yeah. we look at that part of it, too? Oh, sure. What it would be? Yeah. Yeah. I think private that's properties. private yeah. properties. Yeah. Right. So. But, uh, you know, I'm, we're, t- I don't know. I think it's a slippery slope. Well, looking at it, we're it not can doing be. anything with it yet. So. It can uh, be very slippery. Because <laughs> uh, we're not talking about private commercial property. No, we're not. No. It would, private property would be both commercial and residential. Yeah. Or business and residential. Yeah. Okay. So, any yeah. other new business? Nope. I make a motion to yep. adjourn at 22.36. Mr. Chairman, if I could just, uh, <laughs> the board could bear with me for Uh-oh. a few, to talk to a non meeting with legal counsel afterwards. I'd appreciate it for a few okay. minutes. Yeah, a motion to go into non public under RSA 91. No, I don't need a non public. Non, non meeting. Right. So, we're going to adjourn this. You made a motion to adjourn? What time? Motion to adjourn at 22.36. Excellent. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. All right. So we're going to a non-meeting. Uh Uh-oh.